Were you going to say something? No, no, I was just oh. taking notice of Phil there, uh, waving his hand. <laughs> so if, I, I have a question. Vin, Vin, Vincenzo? Um, Chair Pierce, if you'd like, because I have the motion, um, because I serve as clerk, when it comes time for the vote, if you'd like, I can roll call the CPC as well. It's up to you. Yeah, that's okay. If you want to do that, uh, Vincenzo. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It'll work the same either way. All right. David. All right. So I, I will call this joint meeting of the select board and CPC together. I'm joined by my colleagues on the select board, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mrs. Gonzalez, and Mr. Studo. And I'm joined by the full CPC membership, Mr. Pierce, Mr. Carroll, Mr. Hayden, and Mr. Rudloff. If we could begin the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So our, our first order of business is the joint meeting with the Community Planning Commission to appoint a Community Planning Commission member. And why don't I let you take over from here, Mr. Pierce. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Vincenzo, uh, Vincenzo, did you want to make the motion and we'll... Uh... Yeah, do you do you want to give the recommendation first? Uh, I think I think we're both on the same page, or I can just make the motion up to you. Well, just go ahead and make the motion, and we you know we can just go from there. So okay. why don't I just state for the members of the public that there was already a joint uh, hearing held regarding this appointment. Mm -hmm. It is an elected position, but uh, one of the members uh, resigned a little bit early, Mr. Bellavance, whom we thank for his service. And so we need to fill the unexpired term uh, prior to the next election. And that was the purpose for the prior joint hearing of both boards to interview candidates. And a as a result of that previous uh, joint public hearing to interview candidates, there are some nominees that have um, be become the candidates that uh, want to be right Ms. the cpc wants to put into nomination this evening right okay, okay. So, so we have a motion mr studo yes. madam chair i moved in accordance with the provision of massachusetts general law chapter 41 section 81a the community planning commission and the select board jointly appoint one of the following individuals Jeremiah Johnston to fill the vacant unexpired elected term on the Community Planning Commission through the May 20, May 4, 2021 annual town election. Okay, so we have uh, nominations yeah, open. Yeah, Mr. Mr. O'Leary, we need a second oh, on that. No, no, to no, discuss we need both it. names and nomination. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Appoint one of the following individuals, sorry, Jeremiah Johnston or Matthew Dumont. What's the last name? Dumont? Dumont. D-U-M-O-N-T. Okay. So I have a motion by Mr. Studo. If, open Sorry. nominations. Mr. O'Leary seconds. Are there any further nominations? Okay. So no. hearing none. We will close nominations, and this is a roll call vote. Mr. Studa will be calling roll call for both. Uh, both actually, I'm sorry. We need to hear from the liaison first, Mr. Studo. Excuse um, me, I apologize. So, uh, after discussion at the CPC meeting, um, I concur and agree with uh, Chair Pierce and the CPC that we nominate Jeremiah Johnston to fill the position until May 4th of 2021. Okay, any dis further discussion? Mr. O'Leary. Has Mr. Johnston uh, agreed to pull papers and run in, in the May election? Um, yes, I can answer that. It has Mr. Dumont also agreed to do so? Yes, when we, asked the, when we asked them both the question, they both agreed that they would pursue papers for the upcoming election. Okay, any other further discussion? All right, so hearing none, we have a motion. 
we're going to take a roll call vote. Mr. Studer, will you call the roll? Yes. Uh, should I do select board first or CPC first? I'm sorry. Sure. Okay. Uh, Chair Manny Pelly. Mr. Johnston. Mr. Walner. Mr. Johnson. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Mr. Dumont. Mr. S no, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Johnston. And Mr. Studo is <clears throat> Mr. Johnston. Mr. Pierce. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Carroll. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Hayden. Mr. Johnston. Mr. Rodloff. Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair, uh, I'd yes. like to, uh, to have my vote uh, re-recorded uh, for Mr. Johnston to make it unanimous. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. So we have unanimous vote of both boards for Mr. Johnston and we welcome him. And Danielle, we see you now. So you know, yeah, if I you're going to convey the news and yeah. we'll go from there. Okay, if I may, Madam Chair, could I have just a moment? Absolutely. Um, I You're next say, anyway, Mr. Pierce. So. <laughs> okay. I wanted to let everybody know that both of the candidates are outstanding. And yes. once, and this is the second time where we've had to choose somebody where all the candidates were outstanding. They were all good. I think it's just a great thing that we're getting that quality of candidate to uh, volunteer for these positions. So, so um, the vote was um, obviously just as difficult as the last time we had to do this. So I want to thank both of them for applying and hope that the other one continues, and Mr. Noir continues his, uh, his uh, pursuit of, of uh, work within the town. Their yeah, resumes were pretty impressive. Absolutely. Both, both gentlemen were pretty impressive. Uh, uh, and Madam Chair, I, I would like to encourage, you know, Mr. Dumont to either look for the Economic Development Committee or the, uh, the, the Wastewater Committee, which we haven't uh, formulated yet. There's some opportunities for people like Mr. Dumont, then again, Mr. Johnson, to continue to be involved. And uh, I think uh, we should, we should be encouraged by that, but also encourage ourselves to make sure that they stay engaged and give them an opportunity to serve. Great, yes. There's plenty of plenty of places we can use your help. Mr. Studo. And Madam Chair, I it's funny, uh, Mr. O'Leary, that we talked about at the meeting that the first thing we said is that irrespective of who is appointed, the other should definitely be on the EDC. Uh, Chair yeah. Pierce, I, I feel I like we talked about that. And, yes, uh, we did. And we encourage everyone to run. Like, I, I, I feel like you get the best of people during competition. So yeah. I feel like if they, you know, anyone who feels like, I, I definitely agree with that. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy, Mr. O'Leary, you brought it up, but it, we, we're kind of all on the same page on that. So that's nice. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. And our next order of business begins with the departmental budget hearings and we're beginning with CPC, Mr. Pierce. And yes. go ahead. Thank you, uh, Danielle, have a, do you have a, uh, or you have our budget? Yes, I do. Um, will I uh, share my screen? Is that the best way to do it? Okay. Yes, that's worked pretty well, Danielle, if you're able to do okay. that. Mr. Mr. Danielle, just, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanna make sure, I think we, we now have we have Mrs. Hurlbut, we have a Mr. Gamer, we have Mr. Um, did I see Mr. Johnson? Do we not have? We have Mr. Bailey, Mr. Kelleher, Mr. Mills, and am I missing anyone else from finance? Is that everybody, Mr. Gilberto from finance? I, I believe so. Did you, you said Mr. Kelleher? No, yes. Mr. Kelleher, yeah. So we have a quorum of finance to be joining us for, the, for these hearings as well. So thanks, Mrs. McKnight. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Oh, no, that's okay. I was actually just oh, pulling this up. Okay. Um, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. I'm Governor. sorry to, to interrupt it, but uh, I, I'll only do it once tonight because I know I did it three times on Saturday. <laughs> All right. But, but I will just let folks who are watching at home know that um, because of uh, the limitations anticipated in the FY22 budget, um, departments, boards, and committees were really asked to uh, limit their requests for the operating budget for the upcoming year. 
And as such, we've asked them um, both because of that and because of the virtual platform that we're on this evening here to limit or abbreviate their presentations. And Madam Chair, I believe your intention is to take questions at the end of the presentations. Um, the feedback I think we all heard was that that seemed to work pretty well on, on Saturday. Um, for the public who is viewing at home, um, the uh, operating budget uh, is up on the town's website on the homepage and you're able to access it um, through a link if you wanna follow along. Um, these presentations will be uh, added uh, at a later time. And, and I'll just add to that because it did seem to work out well. If, every, if both committees could hold their questions till the end, I'm actually just gonna roll call all of the members. If you have any questions, if you don't, you can just say no questions or any questions or comments at the end. Thank you for the reminder, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. Danielle, I think it's time for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, this should be four and a half minutes, I timed it. Um, okay, so just as I begin the presentation of, can everyone uh, see the screen share? Okay, yes. great. <laughs> um, just as I begin the presentation of the CPC's FY22 uh, budget. Danielle, one request, yes. make it six minutes. You speak very quickly. Maybe it's in four and a half minutes. Make it six. Okay, <laughs> I'll try. Um, just want to note that I used the select board's uh, 2021 and beyond strategic plan to prepare this year's budget um, since I wasn't aware of an update and the items still appeared relevant and things we're still working on. Um, each of the CPC's goals and objectives for FY22 are aligned with one or more of the select board's objectives, and I've indicated each of these in my accompanying budget narrative. Highlights of um, whoop, FY21 and uh, current projects. Um, the master plan, um, after uh, completing our community master plan last year, the CPC prioritized uh, action items from the plan relating to Main Street. Um, town meeting approved funds for a traffic study and conceptual redesign of Route 28. Um, a contractor has been selected for this study um, or for this work and the contract is in process. The CPC has also completed a significant portion of its work with abacus architects and planners on uh, redevelopment concepts for the Main Street, Winter Street area. Owner and stakeholder outreach as well as conversations about next steps for this project will take place in the next few months. Um, this uh, will include what we hope will be a productive conversation um, also with the facilities master plan committee so um, we can come to a good uh, consensus about the best way forward for these properties. Um, E-permitting, the planning department has worked closely with building to implement the new e-permitting system which is now in use for building, planning, health, DPW and fire and conservation in the town clerk for business certificates only um, are under development. Housing, um, following up on both the master plan recommendations and the housing production plan completed in 2018, uh, we have received grant funds for technical assistance to guide in the development of senior affordable housing on Carpenter Drive. We've been working with consultants to do soil testing and to develop concept plans um, and a draft RFP, and we hope to schedule a neighborhood meeting soon to hear resident feedback on those concepts. The next step would be discussion with the select board of um, uh, to finalize an RP and following that we would be preparing for a town meeting action um, potentially in October. For economic development, uh, the CPC continues to work with the economic development committee which took a hiatus from meeting for the first part of 2020 due to the pandemic but has been meeting again. I have been working to coordinate the microenterprise grant program um, administered by the state, as well as make information available about other COVID relief programs for businesses. The open space plan, um, the planning department led the, depart the, led the update of the town's open space and recreation plan um, update, working closely um, with parks and recreation and managing MAPC's consulting work in preparing the plan. Uh, the plan was approved by the state in June. Um, FY22 goals and objectives um, for the master plan. In the near term, the CPC's key priorities still include various Main Street initiatives, including the conceptual redevelopment plan, zoning and exploring reconstruction and design. Um, goals also include a few of the many housing recommendations from the master plan, including the Carpenter Drive redevelopment, exploring the affordable housing overlay district parcels, and beginning to investigate an, access an accessory dwelling unit bylaw. For transportation, we would like to pursue construction funds for the Central Street sidewalk. Uh, we plan to make an application um, in FY22 to the Complete Streets program in hopes of receiving funds for a portion of the work. 
A capital request has also been submitted. Also, we hope to take findings from last year's park and ride study to the next step, exploring whether there is an opportunity to provide commuter services to neighboring communities MBTA stations or an express bus to Boston. For economic development, um, we'd like to plan some additional um, EBC business outreach, continue supporting the cleanup and redevelopment of brownfields and other underutilized properties, including any progress on 70 Concord Street and support new economic development efforts related to wastewater decisions to be made this year. The EDC could also benefit from the creation of a web-based database of business contacts so that we can more easily communicate funding opportunities and maintain information about COVID-related changes in their operations. And additionally, um, we plan to review uh, subdivision regulations against the town stormwater bylaw and, and the terms of our MS4 permit in order to ensure consistency and compliance and pursue any necessary changes. This was a project we requested funds for last year, but did not pursue um, due to requests to further streamline the budget, but the project would still be beneficial and we would like to pursue it if funds allow. The CPC budget is a level services budget with the exception of the requested $5,000 um, in small capital for that review of uh, the subdivision and site plan regulations that I just mentioned. Um, some master plan recommendations might be associated with new funding, but as in FY21, um, those would be anticipated to be standalone projects that would be more appropriate for um, it's or, or, um, warrant article warrant funding, article funding. Oh, or, or, oh, grant or, funds. or grant funds oh, echoing. Echoing. Um, rather than, um, rather than this is in the operating budget. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, so we'll uh, start with a select board, see if any of the members have any questions. Mr. O'Leary, you're muted. Uh, Danielle, could you go back to that FY22 uh, goals and objectives? Slide. Great, thank you. Yes. A few questions. Uh, one, in relation to the uh, Main Street, Winter Street intersection and everything that's going on there and the consultants that we've engaged uh, just for um, informational purposes and more transparency here, are we anticipating a public-private engagement here as far as resources in order to make something work here, whether it be you know the town investing in wastewater treatment or purchasing any parcels in order to effectuate the change in that area? Well, the idea of this project initially was to figure out how private money could be leveraged. So if the town were to figure out a good plan, figure out whether um, this type of work would be feasible um, as far as sharing a package treatment system or possibly, you know, if, if sewer was a possibility, I'm um, connecting that way. The idea was for us to look at what would be possible, but that the money would be private investment. Um, that was really the original idea behind this project. Um, I know that over the years, um, the possibility has come up because one of the properties has been on the market. Um, that I know that there's been no decision made about that. So the way that we have been working through this project is that, um, or I shouldn't say there's no decision made about it. I, I, I should say that I know that it has not been fully discussed whether the town would, would be inclined to spend money. Um, but I guess I should say that as we have worked through this project, we've made sure that any concepts would be um, that it would be possible to look at redevelopment if it were entirely private or if there were some kind of municipal use. And a municipal use could be any number of things, um, but of course, there, because there has been no you know, firm discussion about whether that could be a possibility, um, that's not a requirement of this project. And so I think we've tried really hard to make sure that any development concepts could be possible with um, just entirely private money and that the town's contribution so far has been you know, the investment in, in the study, um, having the um, sewer treatment um, plant sharing possibility looked at to see if it was possible. Our consultants found that yes, it was possible. And here are some ideas of development that could potentially come from that. I think any further decisions are are, are, are discussions that have still to be had. I don't is know if that answers the In question. the upcoming fiscal year, do we anticipate the need for additional funds for additional uh, consulting fees to further the study? You know, in the I, upcoming fiscal year. I mean, I just don't want it to drop mm -hmm. dead in the water because 
you know, we, we've got some concepts, we've got some ideas, and we're looking to move forward, then we need to investigate further, and we don't have the funding to do it. So my concern is that we're not requesting enough funds to move the ideas forward. At this point in the project, we have not identified the need for further funds right now, but I think if, if as the conversation moves on and as the project progresses, if it became apparent that we really, that we did need more money, I think that that would be the type of request we wouldn't make through the operating budget. I think it would be a warrant article, at least, or, or potentially capital or whatever, whatever the item was. I don't, um, I never really saw a place for it in the operating budget because I wasn't sure if that type of money, which would be kind of project specific, would be an appropriate addition to the operating budget. Um, I'm just thinking about, you know, if we needed a cusp period to, to continue uh, the study rather than waiting for an additional warrant article to be approved, then maybe some additional consulting fees might be required to assist in facilitating the ongoing effort as opposed to, you know, waiting six months plus, depending upon what a COVID situation here, you know, six months plus four for an additional town meeting. I think that's a good question. Honestly, I hadn't thought about asking for more money for that. Um, if, if, if it's I may, something, Danielle, I'm sorry. If I, if I may, um, you know, we still have some work to do, Steve. So we've got some things we're still working on. Um, and as in, in, up to and including this, uh, talking to the stakeholders to find out where everybody's at. And at that particular point, we'll have a better idea of how how uh, how um, this pro how this process can be moved along, and whether we need any more funds. So I think for the t as Danielle said, for the time being, uh, and it would be a warrant. I, I would definitely see it as a warrant article. So okay. for the, and the only thing I'm talking about warrant, and you know, I, I'm as impatient as you are, and as patient as you are. You've been on the CPC probably as long as I've been on this board. Yeah. Um, you know, and we've been incrementally inching forward, you know, on certain things. And I just would hate to see another 12 months pass and yeah. lose six months uh, with any progress. In it. That, that's the only reason for my question. I very much appreciate that, that those feelings and that concept, but, uh, but we do, but as I said, we still have, we still have some things. We want to make sure that what we bring forward is something that um, is doable and, and, and that a, uh, that a developer would pick up and do. So we're, we're, that's one of the things we're working on right now. All right. Yeah, the other question I have is in relation to affordable housing and the uh, the overlay districts that that's being considered. You know, going may be considered at the June town meeting. Uh, is there a need for any additional uh, resources to look at other areas of, of town for an overlay district parcel? Because I'm thinking of at least one, maybe another, uh, as far as conceptually, which may not have been included previously. You know. Uh, do we need any additional resources to do that to include other parcels within the community for an overlay district? Mm. Sure. I, I mean, I think that as far as what we have in the affordable housing overlay district, we haven't, um, since that overlay was created, we haven't done any specific work looking at the individual properties that are in that district and none of them have been developed yet. So I don't know if, um, I mean, I would, I would think that when it comes to affordable housing, my recommendation would be to start with those parcels that are in the district already right. um, and to continue the work for Carpenter Drive um, and also to explore the accessory dwelling unit bylaw, which is definitely one of those issues that, you know, whether or not we do it, well, you know, still remains to be seen, of course, but it's one of the things that keeps coming up again and again and again. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we would necessarily my own personal recommendation might be that we not um, necessarily look at adding more property to our affordable housing overlay before we've maybe explored the ones that we do have, which we would love to do. But I don't know if any of the have, CPC members- The ones that we have are not being developed and there's potential for other areas within the community for consideration. Do we need additional consulting services to do that or can we do it in-house? I think for- that at least initially right now, I would say we would do it in house with the help of the regional housing services office. Mm -hmm. We do have, you know, hours, consulting hours that we get from them um, for this type of thing. I think if it grew into a really big project and we had a goal of, you know, a whole big rezoning and everything at that point, we might need money, but I don't really foresee that happening yet. I just think um, of the proposal that's before us, which appears to be single-minded, um, 
as opposed to maybe we should be looking at something else in addition to uh, for consideration. Yeah, the, the I, one on Park Street. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're um. Uh, I'm, I'm talking one specifically Park about Street. the one on Park Street that's been proposed. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, should we be able to take a different look at things and couple other parcels with that? That's and do a we good need point. Consulting services. If we don't, mm -hmm. fine. If we do, let's mm -hmm. budget for it. I mean, if if it seems like it would be a good idea to have more money in our professional services budget that can be dedicated to housing, we do have, I mean, that's an easy way to put it in. I mean, if that's something that would be helpful for me to research about how money, how much money would be helpful, what could be needed, I could have a conversation with our housing consultant and get a recommendation. We could potentially add a small amount of money to that line, line item. Um, that would give us some flexibility for spending it. Is that something that would be good for me to look into. Okay, I, again, I'm just looking at, you know, what's facing us as far as mm -hmm. a, um, an opportunity, let's put it as an opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, is there some other places that we should be looking for and do we need additional consulting services to consider those or are we able to do it in-house? If, if we're not able to do it in-house, then I think we should be able to um, appropriate some funds to do it, to address it on a timely basis so that we're not making an appearance of spot zoning, which I'm right. confident that it's not. But uh, well, if I may, Steve, I think that um, that right now we have uh, our, you know, we have we have plenty of work to do on the uh, in our in our housing overlay district that we have now. But again, but I agree with Danielle. If there was a, if there was a, a large amount, a small amount of money that went into that account, that would give us the opportunity, should it arise, to look at these. A little closer that would not be a bad thing but i don't think we're talking a whole lot of money here no we're not i just want to make sure we have it that's all yeah and, and again, i, I think we need to we're, we're, we're going to need to move on but i yeah. think this is a broader topic i think what the, we have a lot of other departments waiting and i think that these were streamlined for purposes of this right. budget and this meeting but however these are you know other things that we probably need a, a longer meeting to discuss these in full okay. although Based on your comments, I'm sure we're going to hear from other members to Mr. O'Leary. But I think what Danielle tried to do and the CBC tried to do was give us a packaged budget that, you know, fits right. in, consistent with everyone else's budget this year. It's a little bit different than what we've done before in the past few years, but just due to the financial constraints and COVID-19 and everything that we've had to address right now. So, but we do need to move on because we have multiple members that I have to ask if they have questions about this particular budget presentation. So if we can, if we can move on, Mr. O'Leary, was that the, it was yeah, that? I just, I just want to highlight that, you know, we may need just some additional funds for, to address immediate situations rather than yes. taking the streamlined approach and ignoring okay. situations. All okay. right. I'm fine. Thank you. Mr. Walner, do you have any, Mr. Walner, I can't see you, but do you, I know oh. you're with us. Do you have any questions? I am here. <laughs> okay, there you uh, are. No, just comments. I have been a big fan of the CPC for many years. I think I've attended all the studies they've done over the last six, seven years and have participated. And uh, it's nice to see some of these projects coming out in the fiscal year 22 goals and objectives. Um, it's nice to hear that we want to give you more money to, uh, to, uh, <laughs> make sure you get everything done the way what you know as timely and as quickly as you can because i think the cpc is recognizing they are doing community planning the demographics are changing and we have to anticipate that change and i think cpc has been stepping up to do that and uh you know the next uh, few years of work will be really um uh, be defining our future for many 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 years to come so it's very important work so thank you and uh danielle i always say you're one of the most important people in town um Thanks for doing so much planning. It it goes right to my heart. So thank you. Thanks, Mr. Thank Waller. Mr. Mr. Studo, any questions, comments? No, my comment. I I I agree with everything Mr. Waller said. Participating in the meetings, um, you know, I really didn't know exactly what the CPC did up until and then you see, and they serve a great purpose where they can definitely give us uh, direction. Uh, that's like a commentary on the CPC. 
you know, on, on individual projects, I do see here that, yeah, I mean, I, I it, it's kind of, I've heard it before just because I've been participating in the meeting. So a lot of this is not new to me. Um, so I, I just think that, uh, you know, from a budgetary standpoint, we'll just, you know, I'm not saying we should take a wait and see approach, but, you know, as the CPC needs funds, if any, after anything they already have appropriated, I do think that maybe we should leave it up to them to ask for more. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez. Yeah, um, I just had a question about the park and ride. Um, I, I just wanted to ask is, are, are we going to be looking into like paying into the MBTA? Is that the idea? Well, the idea I think would be an expansion of um, when we first started the contract with MBRTA for the ring and ride service, um, the thought was that after the first year or so, we would look at the data to see if that could be expanded in any way, because we, um, I think we were, we were not paying our whole assessment that was previously for the MBTA being redirected for MVRTA. And um, I know time has gone by and certainly there have been other priorities with the pandemic and everything else. Um, but at some point I would love it this year to, to pick that up again and to see whether there would be a possibility of expansion. Um, we did a study, uh, I guess it's two years ago now um, that looked at what budget issues would go along with um, what the costs would be to set up um, uh, like a, a commuter service getting people either to T stations or shuttle bus to Boston and all of them seemed doable if there was money and it would be more than the MBTA assessment though it would be the, the town coming up with additional funds. So that's definitely something that would still be in its early stages but we have a study that sort of laid the foundation for it and I'd love to continue that conversation at some point. if we can. Sorry, thank you. For, thank you for that. Um, and just, just my comment, I, I, I agree with my colleagues. Um, as a Mr. Pierce, and um, I spent a lot of time <laughs> sitting at CPC meetings back in the day when we were um, building and we had a, a builder um, developing around us. So I got to a uh, front row seat to quite a few CPC meetings and I appreciate everything that they do. They do a lot and they do they, I don't think they're appreciated as much as they should be. So I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to go to the members of the finance committee for any questions. And if you don't have any, that's okay. I'm just, I just can't see you all. So I'm going to, I'm just going to roll call your names. Mrs. Hurlbut. Danielle. Do you think you can unshare the screen? Um, that yes, might also sorry. help me. I have no questions, um, oh. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Gamer? This probably doesn't have any questions either. Oh, Mr. Gamer, you are yes. muted. Any questions? You're still muted. Your lower left-hand corner there, Ben. Ah, uh, there we go. New tablet. Go. Um, so no, my only comment, I've, I've said this almost every year, this is one of the most underfunded departments in my opinion. And, uh, you know, so I'll just echo the comments of, of folks on the board. I think, you know, this, this year we have a specific strategy, but, you know, I'd love to see, you know, whatever we can't get in this year, we just address in the, in the next year, because I do believe, and I'll echo the comments, this is a very important department and one that I think has been underfunded in years past. But no other questions from my end. Thanks, Mr. Gamer. Mr. Johnson? No questions. Okay. Mr. Hegarty? No questions, thank you. Mr. Bailey? Uh, just a comment. <laughs> As I understand that the senior overlay that's being proposed for the center of town, for, for the affordable, housing uh, commitment that they're making. One of the options they laid out was to maybe just pay the town, give the town funding in lieu of providing affordable housing. So, so it's, it's really just for consideration. It doesn't make sense to explore that and use that funding to, you know, for the town's own plans for developing affordable housing, particularly in light of, you know, maybe our commitment being met with the land ratio that's, you know, under consideration for the, uh, for the own project. So. So just, just something to think about if that's something we ought to be 
considering as an option for that as we could go further on that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bailey. Mr. Kelleher? I have no questions. Mr. Mills? No questions. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Danielle. Thanks. Um, I think that is all the members of the Finance Committee, right, Mr. Gilberto? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Speak and just speaking from the chair, the linkage fees is a great, um, suggestion to ponder it's it didn't it wasn't incorporated into the pro, i think it's in the in the works right mrs mcknight that proposed zoning is in the works right now it wasn't incorporated into that the original draft that we were given by um the applicant uh, who's preparing um this uh, did include a number of options for how to meet the affordability requirement. And one of them was a donation to the town um, in lieu of creating the units. And that would need to go into um, an affordable housing trust. Um, we, we, don't have, have, we don't have, we don't have. Now, initially when the CPC looked at it, um, all of the various possibilities for um, how to meet that um, obligation were considered. Um, the feedback that I got from the applicant's attorney was that it was um, a suggestion that they got from the finance committee that they should develop the housing on site. So it's my understanding that in the most recent draft, they changed it so that it would just be to develop it on site. Um, I mean, certainly we can talk about any of the options, um, but that was, I think, the, the reason that was changed. Um, I do think that just from a practical standpoint, developing the housing, if we want the housing, um, getting the developer to do it on the site or off the site, but but as part of the project is really the easiest and most efficient thing usually so that the town doesn't have to do it, but it, there are certainly lots and lots of ways it could be done. And I think we when we when we had the when we talked about that at our meeting, we we did discuss that sort of the the, the the it doesn't make sense to just pay in and do it elsewhere when you're adding the, adding to the housing stock. But I also had a question on that um, because as a as a board, in terms of the another matter that came before us for for just a discussion was Pulte. As a board, we took a resolve vote that we wanted 20% of the proposed units to be um, affordable. And I, so I think as a board, and I don't, I can't speak for the board in terms of this particular overlay proposal, but I can speak for myself that I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It should be, we should be expecting that of anyone, especially if we're letting an applicant write the zoning instead of taking the zoning on ourselves. So I, I think that should be revisited and I'm sure it'll be an issue that I raise when the zoning comes back to the board, if and when the zoning comes back to the board. So I just had one, <laughs> one more comment too, because I, and then I'll get to you, I'll get you. I'm gonna finish my comments and then go back because now we have more questions, I think, so, or comment. On, and with regard to the Winter Street, which also came before us, I'm heartened to hear that the next steps are gonna be to connect with the property owners because aside from that one owner who's maybe been in, in you know, somewhat involved in this process, we're actually, having studies done to redesign private land and the private landowners aren't even involved in that. So I'm glad to hear that these are the people that should be connected and sewed up into this design phasing and design studying. So I'm glad to see that that's going to be done because it otherwise to me doesn't make sense because you're affecting private parcels in, in some, some, a number of residents live on at least one of the, you know, privately owned parcels. So I'm glad to hear that. And also glad to see how much progress you have. It's just been amazing progress with regard to the work that you've done. So I wanted to echo what my colleagues have said as well. And now we're just gonna go a couple more questions, I think. Don's got his hand raised and Abby's Abby's waving her finger at me. So <laughs> we'll let's start with What'd Don. What'd you do? <laughs> so we'll start with Don. <laughs> just, just a comment at the the uh, finance committee meeting when we talked about this overlay district i had raised the question with the with the applicant because i thought he was being a little vague about how they were going to satisfy the the affordable housing and whether it was going to be on site or some other unnamed location in town and uh, i asked him if 
that information would be available before we have to vote on this at June town meeting. So it wasn't that, that it necessarily was precluding anything else. I just wanted some clarity on what his plans were. Um, and apparently he's decided that he's going to, from what I, what I heard you just say, or somebody just say, going to put the, the affordable housing units in the, uh, uh, at that development. But that really wasn't the question. The question was, why don't you tell us what you're going to do before we have to vote on it so we know what we're voting on. I understand, okay. Yep. Our meeting was at, was after that finance meeting, so maybe it, it was it maybe he modified it for after after he met with the finance committee. So, okay, all set, Mr. Keller. Hey, thank you, Ms. Mrs. Hurl, but Yeah, um, you know, basically, uh, Don is giving you a pretty good overview of some of the discussion that took place at FinCom. I think that uh, the applicant had talked in terms of putting five units of affordable housing on another piece of property that he owns in town. And that sort of smacked of a ghetto and it wasn't particularly appealing. There was never any discussion at the finance committee about putting money into an affordable housing trust. Um, and furthermore, it's not the finance committee's job to make these decisions. Uh, this was simply um, uh, the applicant wanting to go to different meetings and get feedback. Thank you, Mrs. Hurlbut. Okay, I think that that is everyone on, on uh, both the board and the finance committee. Anything else, Mr. Pierce? Oh, I think that's, uh, I think that's it. Okay, thank you. But I do Thanks, thank you all for your input. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, I know we have Mrs. Prenny here. Our next um, budget for review is elder services. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. good evening. Good Welcome. evening. Thank you. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I do have a small presentation. As you can see, I'm asking for a status quo budget, same as 2021. Only exception is again this year, I am asking that our outreach assistance hours be increased permanently to a full-time 35 hour a week position. This would be an increase of 10 hours, 15 hours paid by the state formula grant and 20 hours paid by the town. I wish I had that crystal ball and could see when the opening the senior center to program would be safe for the staff and all the public. Hopefully with progress being made with the vaccines, we can open sooner than later. It will be one year next Tuesday when I received a phone call at 420 from Michael Berto asking me to come to the police station now for a meeting. After a gasp, he immediately reassured me it wasn't personal. At that time, I was told we, the senior center, was closed immediately. You can imagine how heartbreaking it was for myself, staff, and everyone who comes to the senior center. Our job at the senior center is to promote socialization, well-being, and belonging a place to learn new things and share things, share hugs, kindness, laughter, and sympathy when needed. Recently, we have brought into the building many flowering plants just for the sense of new life. I was in our building working every day in the past year, even if it was just for a few hours a day to take phone calls and answer emails, especially in the first few months of the pandemic. Staff worked remotely at home during the beginning months, but always managed to take phone calls and answer emails, and we constantly communicated with each other. The month of April was the most difficult. As I looked out my office window to the north on Havel Street, usually a very busy street, there was no traffic. Out in the west window, there were no children in the playground, the teacher's cars parked at the Batchelder School. But I think the saddest part was out the east window, looking at Croswell's funeral home. Only one or two cars were parked to attend their loved one's funeral. John Croswell told me last April was the busiest and saddest month he ever had in business. In saying all that, we at the center spent most of our days the past year on outreach. In the beginning, we sent out a short newsletter to 2,300 homes, reminding people they were not alone and information on how to stay safe. In June, we did a door-to-door -door visit to 1,200 individual households of residents over 70 and passed out packages of masks along with information bookmarks. We made 900 robocalls to residents 
in three various times, reminding people all the senior center was closed to the public. We as a department reminded them that there was, we were there to help. Just recently, we sent vaccine information to over 2,300 residents. We made hundreds of repeat phone calls to residents checking on their well-being. Plus we sent hundreds of cards, thinking view cards, birthday cards, Christmas cards, and in return, we got so many thank yous. Until March of last year, we provided 2,100 rides, 4,100 participants joined in various programs and were able to offer 150 residents few insurance and tax services. This is all done in our one room senior center in a building that's 192 years old. The staff handled approximately 8,000 intake calls in which people were helped internally or referred to outside agencies. For Halloween, we, well, actually it was Sherry Gear with DPW's help, decorated the entire front of the building as a giant spider web, which the entire community got to appreciate and also had a drive-by Halloween luncheon for 40 of our residents. For Veterans Day, with the generosity of the North Reading Little League, we hosted another drive-by lunch in for our veterans with home deliveries for those who couldn't make it. For Thanksgiving, we helped organize Representative Jones and Senator's drive-by Thanksgiving gift bag at the Hillview for 200 residents. And this coming March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, we will honor the tradition at the Edith O'Leary Senior Center for a drive-by corned beef and cabbage lunch carried, uh, catered by the Hush. In our partnership with Mystic Valley Elder Services, I am proud and honored to say that we serve 1,900 cardboard daily meals until the close in March. We delivered over 11,000 home delivered meals, all delivered by Bob Grady, our driver, without missing one day, one day of delivering through all the pandemic. And just a side note, I want you to know that folks who came to the senior center every day and needed that hot watch went on the home delivered meal list. In 2020, Mystic Valley continued to provide services valued at $2,106,655. That was a 13% increase from last year to North Reading residents and their families, which again shows the need to have a full-time outreach work on staff. Even though their building was not open to the public, their amazing staff worked remotely every day without missing intakes or disruption of services. Since the beginning of February, when vaccines became available and the state advertised to everyone in every available website to call their councils on aging and senior centers, and they would help in getting the public an appointment for the vaccine. Our phones have been off the wall. This announcement came without warning and no training. Although it seems every agency that serves the elder community came out with a how-to manual a few weeks later. So to Sherry, Gear, Sherry Graff, Sue Tilton, Jean Fitzgerald, and Marcy Bailey and her secret army who volunteer to help navigate the ever-changing, very complicated state's registration prep mode system, without the help of others in the 27-page how-to manual, I will be ever, forever grateful for having them, on, having them in my circle. They have been amazing. Without them and our local Board of Health, Bob Racy, Stephanie Conley, Pam Bath, and everyone on their team, the residents of North Reading wouldn't be on their way to securing the vaccine and get it back to some sort of normalcy. But I want to add, the most amazing people have been our senior citizens. Their resiliency, understanding, and patience have been, without a doubt, the most rewarding part, if any, of this horrid virus. So to everybody who helped pitched in, I want to say thank you. And it has been quite a year, especially for our seniors in our department. So that's my schmill. Thank you, Mrs. Prenny. I hope you submit that to the to the paper so they can republish that. That kind it, of said it all. It has been an amazing year and um, it's getting well, better. Yeah, you were pretty streamlined with what you wanted in your budget too. So <laughs> Mr. Thank O'Leary, you. we'll start off with you, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, not much more to say other than, uh, you know, it, it's been an, an incredible year as far as the challenges that you know, all the departments have faced, but in particular Mary's in relation to our seniors and what their their needs are. And their needs are a little bit different. And, um, you know, Mary and her department and all the people who have been supportive of her efforts um, have been able to adapt substantially uh, to address those needs and, and reach out to people and keep in contact. I mean, the key this whole year was constant contact uh, with people and communicating with them and to address uh, what their individual and uh, family needs were and are. 
and it's just been fantastic as to what's what's been accomplished so far and what needs to be accomplished moving forward. And for those people who've been volunteering, you know, like Marcy and his and Mary said here, a secret group of people here who are you know, assisting her, particularly recently to try and get people vaccinated. It's amazing, you know, the resources that are being expended um, on behalf of other people. So it's, it, it's heartening. Um, you know, as far as the outreach coordinator, to me, that's a no brainer. You know, that's what we need. And this uh, particular pandemic highlights the need for outreach and communication. And um, to me that, you know, let's do it. That, that's, you know, whether it fits within our parameters and what, you know, what we've uh, established as far as what we need to do in relation to our budgetary constraints. Um, this is the most vulnerable uh, segment of our community that needs to be addressed. And, um, the partnership with Mystic Valley Elder Services is invaluable. And again, their, their costs have gone up exponentially. And for those of us who can afford it, we should contribute. So uh, enough said. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Thank you, Mary. Mr. Walner. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very aware of the COA being one of my original um, volunteer efforts in town probably 10 years ago, Mary and I, I think is when we first got started. So, um, and it was really nice to see uh, the, the project that we had to find a long time ago, Project 500, um, actually get put into in place way back at the beginning of the COVID, where I think you had some hundred something volunteers in town who did outreach to these households where people are alone and living alone and don't have any other connections. So um, it was really nice to see some of our contingency plans come come to fruition, come to use, and uh, and to have the your group be in the middle of helping to coordinate that. So thank you very much for being that connection to people who need you the most. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez? Barry, you know I'm a fan. Um, I, I believe this is such an important department. It's a pulse point. It's a place for them to get people to gather, have a meal, watch a movie, um, get transportation. And I mean, the endless things that they do there. Um, it's just so important for our community. Um, and during COVID, to relieve fears, to answer questions, to clarify, to point people in the right direction, to help them with computers. Um, all those things, she, they do all those things there and it's just invaluable. So, and the outreach coordinator, I believe that that's been talked about since I've been on. Um, so, you know, I would, I would be all for that. I would love to see that happen for you. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Studo. Uh oh, you have to change diapers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my apologies. I'm having issues with my uh, internet, and I've already told the story too many times of why my internet doesn't work. So I'm going to spare you. But no, uh, I. It's great. It's great what Elder Services does. Uh, being younger, until you get involved more, you don't realize how much they do. So it's nice to look into it, and you know, I've I've had the chance also now to work with. Um, Mr. Prinny a couple of times. So it's, uh, you know, it's, they do a hard job, especially under the current circumstances with COVID. So it's, uh, it's nice. It's really nice to have them around. And sorry about the internet. No, that's all right. All right. Um, Mrs. Hurlbut? All set? Ms. Mr. Gamer? Probably all set to Mr. Johnson. I have no questions. Thank you. Mr. Haggerty. Mr. Bailey. All set. Thanks. Mr. Kelleher. All set. Thank you. Mr. Mills. Uh, no questions. Thank you for summarizing this past year and your efforts. Mary, I just have one quick question for this. And I think you asked for this last year, and I'm pretty sure you asked for this the year before to make that position a full-time position. So I, if, if you 
if you did split the payment of that, that right now, does that individual receive benefits with the town? She does. She last year, you granted 10 more hours. She was originally hired on a 15 hour a week grant. Uh, a couple of years ago, we gave her 10 more hours, which made her eligible for uh, benefits. Okay. And um, the 10 would just give her up to 35 hours, which I must add the past few months have even been beyond the 35 hours. Um, and I just want to add one little thing. Everyone we talked to was just so thankful and grateful and to have a conversation. But for myself and our staff, it was just as amazing to be able to talk to people that we haven't seen or talked to. Um, it was an interesting year, but we met a lot of new people and talked to a lot of people. So um, I was at least happy to have that opportunity. Yes, all right. So I was just wondering in terms of the budget though, it, it isn't that much of a leap. I don't no. want to- Ten hours. I don't really say that in front of Ms. Rourke, but it's ten more hours, and it's already a, it's already a benefited employee. So that's not really much of a, a leap for us to do that. So thank you. Your staff really is lovely. It was Sherry's just wonderful, and all of the people that help you out, and all of your volunteers. It's just wonderful. They're just such an asset to us. So. Thank you for everything you do. I don't think anyone has any more questions. And uh, I think that's it, right? Thank and you all. Mark did ask you for your statement. She put Alrighty, it in the thank chat. You. Send all it right. along. Have a thank good you, way end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. All right. Now our next uh, budget is youth services. And... Mr. Gilberto, who do we have here for youth services? The youth services director, uh, Jennifer Ford. Uh, I oh, yes. believe I saw her. There she is. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, I, I want to start by saying um, I apologize. My PowerPoint that I shared with Liz earlier today, there were some formatting issues. So I apologize if the version that you got um, doesn't look fantastic. So. I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Okay. So I'm also going to make this very short and sweet. Um, my name is Jen Ford. For anyone who does not know me, I am the director of youth services. And we will start with some of the highlights. Um, so, I mean, they kind of speak for themselves. I, I guess I would start with, um, despite the pandemic, uh, my partial participation numbers for FY21 for eight months has already exceeded FY20 participation numbers by 15%. Uh, also during the year, I, where Youth Services transitioned all of the programming to virtual format to meet the needs um, of the youth during the pandemic including the reality so, fair. You know, took out the windows or the balconies. Uh, um, they're trying are, to make it a so recovery from COVID-19. Uh, Jen, you need to unmute. Did I mute myself? Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I have to mute everybody in order to correct this. Madam Chair, um, yes. you need to unmute yourself as well. Sorry yes. about that, folks. It was just some feedback so we uh, couldn't hear you. Okay, no, 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 thank you. Um, I would say one of the biggest highlights, at least for me, which was a really cool thing to be part of was FaceTime with Santa. Um, we were able to individually FaceTime with 109 youth. All of those youth were brand new to youth services. and um, Fortunately, I know a Santa Claus and uh, we were able to, I got individual information from all of the youth in advance. So the calls were very, very individualized and the feedback that I got from that was just truly amazing. Another new program that uh, Youth Services Office offered was the Pen Pal Club. Um, definitely with effort of trying to keep everyone connected. Anyone who knows me knows that my focus is keeping connected, building community, all of that. And needless to say, during a pandemic, that was a bit more challenging. Uh, 
again, during, during the year, I still partnered with Flint Memorial Library and the High School International Club. We offered free language lessons, uh, worked very closely with elder services and veteran services, needless to say, their populations were directly impacted. And while my population was impacted, I had different tools I could use to stay in contact, whereas elder services and veterans were not. Uh, so we partnered a lot for a lot of outreach efforts. Um, sorry. So this next screen here are the real highlights. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm, I'm about kids. I'm not about numbers. One kid is enough to me. And these to me are the real highlights. Um, the feedback, the difference that youth services makes in kids' lives. Again, anyone who knows me knows that I focus on community, um, creating a judgment-free environment, safe connection. And when you read through this feedback, there's that common theme. So to me, that, that's the true success of youth services. <clears throat> as far as moving forward, some of my goals obviously have repeated because unfortunately we were not able to accomplish them in FY21, uh, but definitely moving into FY22, Youth Services will continue to facilitate programming specifically around mental health because the reality is as a society we were kind of dropping the ball pre-pandemic and the impact on mental health is going to be quite significant. It already is proving to be. So uh, a lot of the focus will be on mental health and anything else related to COVID. Uh, I also hope to create a youth-driven uh, podcast. Um, while, uh, while changing the reality fair to a virtual format, I uh, started considering doing some sort of a financial literacy cur curriculum for high school students. Um, I'd also like to offer the um, graduating senior lottery when I say lottery, because it's, it's, it would be a scholarship, but it would be less about academics and more about youth services participation. And it literally would be then more of a lottery format uh, to consider partnering or to continue partnering with school and community stakeholders uh, regarding social justice for all of our residents, uh, continue to um, partner partner up and collaborate as far as intergenerational activities. And then um, I know I've been talking about this from day one, but to still really explore the potential of a youth services store. We've talked about it many times about the many layers of benefits and uh, I'd, I'd still like to consider that. Again, I get that because of COVID money is very tight, but uh, the really the missing piece to kind of achieving all of these goals is the manpower. You know, when when I look at everything that's been accomplished with youth services and I get really excited thinking of with just a little more manpower, how much more we could really do. That's all I got. So does anyone have any questions or comments? A lot. So how about we kick it off with you, Mr. O'Leary? Again, Jen, you know, this year has been challenging and it's um, not surprising that, uh, you know, more participants today than there were pre-COVID. I mean, it's, uh, it's wonderful that we have the resources available for people to, to reach out, whether it be parents, you know, or the kids themselves, and the word of mouth is actually working and, you know, people are reaching out to you and your, your department here, and it's, it's wonderful. I think the issues that you address in relation to social justice or uh, intergenerational things or, you know, and I know it becomes very personal you know, for a lot of these kids, as far as the outreach and the response that you give them is you know, uh, something that's invaluable. So, you know, for your efforts, you know, you're to be applauded and with everything else that you're involved in too, you know, you're not just youth services, you're on a lot of other things and it's greatly appreciated. And uh, whatever, I, whatever I can do personally to support your efforts, you, you have it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner? Yeah, um, you know, uh, Jen, Jen and I have worked together for a number of years and never more so than this year. Um, one of the, the, the best things that we worked on this year was to work on that age-friendly task force initiative. And that was a major project that required a lot of time. Um, you know, I have a saying that, it, well, it's not my saying, 80% of a good job is showing up. Jen Ford shows up whenever there's a need in the community and it goes beyond youth. 
she definitely shows up for youth. The numbers support that. But she also shows she showed up to help out elder services. Her her thoughts about intergenerational are real. She puts you know sweat and equity into that. And um, I'm just really delighted to have her on board. And I'm always delighted to work with her. So thank you, Jen. And very nice presentation. I really liked it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez. You're muted. Sorry. Thank you, Jen. Um, Jen's also a lot like Danielle. She talks very fast. So when I'm able to join a meeting as liaison, um, I'm always shocked at how much she can say, how much she does, and gets it all said and done very quickly. Um, I'm always like, oh, the meeting's over because <laughs> we go on for hours and hours. <laughs> but she's um, she's great. She gets so so much done. I mean, it look just if you look at what she has here and, and what she accomplishes. And um, I just want to say thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Strudel. I, um, yeah, Ms. Ford, thank you. Uh, I, I've heard about you, never met you, just because there's just so many hours in the day and I don't have enough, so I can't join too many meetings. Um, so thank you. And then, uh, no, great presentation. The goals seem great. Just one question I had, and just for my own, just because I don't understand as much as I want to, can, can you, when you say partner with the school and community, uh, can you just define the social justice piece, like a little bit more how it pertains to North Reading. Um, you know, maybe it's not the avenue, just you, you brought it up. So I figured that's a question I've had in mind, just, you know, in relation to North Reading specifically, not so much outside of North Reading, if yep. you can. Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm part of PAUSE, which this year, one of the subcommittees is social justice. So there's a lot of discussion even as far as curriculum. Um, you know, again, I think that a lot of people, because North Reading isn't necessarily very racially diverse, and we get very caught up with social justice is only a racial mm -hmm. thing, um, that diversity and inclusion encompasses far more than race. And those are discussions that are being had in a lot of different arenas in town. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, no, no, I just, Again, to you, you kind of made my point. Like it just uh, when I read about these things, because I know what North Reading is or mm -hmm. looks like, for lack of a better way to put it, mm -hmm. it, it, it it's hard to uh, apply what you would consider typically social justice to North Reading because of what we are in town. So you yeah. kind of yeah. So it's just uh, maybe yeah. It, it helps clarify that it's not just about X. There's other things going on. So. But with, that, but with that being said, and again, I, I kind of said this in the beginning of my presentation, anyone who knows me, I, I, again, and I appreciate that numbers are important, but it's also important that even if the numbers are just low, that we don't disregard those numbers. So while it might only speak yeah. to three, four, five percent of our population, it's still important to speak to that three, four, five percent of our population and send a very clear message that their needs are as important as anyone else's. I'll just, if I can just add to that just briefly, um, it actually really does affect a large percentage of our population because when you think about our kids as after they leave our bubble, the world out there is a lot different color and a lot different uh, uh, looks than what we currently experience in town. So creating an atmosphere of knowledge and understanding around this issue is really preparing our kids to go out in the world and uh, function the way we, we would expect them to function within our own towns. So it's, it really does have, it really, and it's an emerging issue. It's, it's definitely, you know, for our youth, they need to be prepared for a world that's different than what they experience in town. Thank you. I, I actually think I think it's I think it's directly related to every single one of us and every single student. It's not just about race. It's about gender. It's about disability. It's about inclusion. And it is something that directly relates to every single student in school. So it's not just about race. And it's not just about our numbers in North Reading, because if it if social justice isn't happening in California, it affects the entire 
country, including us. So we shouldn't just be sitting by and not doing something. So I love that as one of your initiatives. I think it's excellent. I wish I would see more of that across the board. And I appreciate that you're doing that. And I also love the fact that your numbers are growing because that's a sign that you are welcoming students and they feel like they belong because if they feel like they belong there and they feel like they're welcome, they're not only going to come back, but they're going to bring more students. So it's not a shock to me because of the work you have been doing for the town and for the youth in the town. It's not a shock that your numbers are growing. And I would fully expect to see that, you know, double next year when you come back to us next year. So I would love to see your department expand. I think it's so crucial, the work that you do. It's as crucial as Mary Prenny's work for the elderly. So I, I really appreciate that. Let's move on to finance. Uh, Mrs. Hurlbut. Thank you. No questions. Mr. Gamer. No questions. Mr. Johnson. Yes. All set. Mr. Hegarty. <clears throat> Um, All set. Mr. Gamer, you didn't have any questions, right? You're no mute. questions there. Okay. Nope. I just want to make sure I go through all the list. Mr. Bailey, you're all set? I am. Mr. Kelleher? Uh, good presentation. No questions. Thank you for what you thank, do. Thank you very much. Mr. Mills? No questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Have a nice night. Thank you, you too. Mrs. Kelleher is here for the library and you have, I think you have other people with you, your trustees. I thought I saw a couple, yes, I do see a few of your trustees with us, so welcome. Thank you very much. I, I'm not sure who else, is, who else is on here, but we have trustees, we have friends, we have um, a lot of people here supporting us this evening. Um, if you just give me a second, I will share my screen and get started. I too have a quick presentation. I know it's gonna be a long night. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to present the FY22 library budget proposal. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sharon Kelleher and I am the director of the Flint Memorial Library. This budget request, $634,376, reflects a 2.8% operational increase it also meets the Municipal Appropriation Requirement, the MAR, which is required to be a certified library by the state. Not included in this year's request is the Adult Services Technology position. This position is needed to provide the expertise and the support necessary for both internal and community technology needs. It will also allow us to expand our homebound services, which we have been hoping to do for a long time. Um, we have asked for this position for the past three years as the need continues to grow. However, we did not include it this year because we are presenting a level services budget. So how did the library evolve to serve the community and deliver services amidst the pandemic? We knew it was very important to keep people connected while providing essential services to the community. We moved operations to the ground floor activity room to create a safe pickup and quarantining location so we could continue to provide printing, scanning, tax forms, and other library services. We shifted funds to resources that could be accessed and utilized at home. We added three new databases geared toward different age groups and different interests. The Friends of the Library purchased 10 mobile hotspots to allow free internet use at home. We changed our policy for our Chromebooks to allow those to be lended. We designed a new user-friendly mobile responsive website, which was funded by state aid. And we launched Tech Help, which is one-on-one -on -one virtual assistance. In addition to the resources we provide, the library staff has found creative ways to stay connected to our patrons. COVID affected every business in some way. Our in-person circulation is down because we closed our doors on March 14th and have remained closed to the public. We expected to see an increase in overdrive, which is up 26%. Although people haven't been able to enter the library, our residents and people from other towns are relying on our resources. Adjusting for the browsing numbers of people not entering the library, our print circulation is still up over 11% over last year. The services that we can provide are being utilized every single day. Another note, we collaborated on virtual programming. We collaborated with Laura Miranda, 
North Reading's mental health counselor on a program about seasonal affective disorder and how it was magnified during the pandemic. The Friends of the Library purchased light therapy lamps to lend to patrons. The response has been so positive, the Friends are purchasing additional lamps to keep up with the demand. We also virtually hosted two of the best-selling adult fiction authors of all time, Robin Cook and James Patterson. Looking forward, we are planning construction of study rooms and an expansion of our partnership with North Reading organizations. We are remaining flexible and ready to adapt to whatever the next year brings us. Thank you. My last one. Oh. And my final slide. Sorry, uh, that's, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I was taking a pause. That's all right. <laughs> um, I would like to acknowledge Stop and Shop for being a true community partner. Without their continued help, the contactless pickup would look a lot different. Thank you also to the staff for working together as a team to not only keep each other safe and healthy, but to continue to provide much needed services to the community. I also want to acknowledge the assistant director, Dan Tremblay, who always remains one step ahead in addressing the state's evolving guidelines. Thank you very much for your time. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just the, the feedback that I've been getting from the community has been phenomenal in relation to uh, your responsiveness to their needs and their uh, desire to you know, get some books, do some reading, interact. It really has been outstanding and you know, kudos to you and your staff and, and the efforts and the, the need to adapt. Uh, yeah, you've met them and, and it's terrific. Just in relation to the adult services uh, technology position, what's, what's the dollar amount associated with that? Uh, the, the position would be 52,000 a year, annual salary. Okay, very good. But again, you know, thank you for all your efforts. And, and again, it's a, you, you play a vital role in the community in relation to uh, outreach and communication. And again, you've done a phenomenal job in adapting and I appreciate it very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Walner? Yeah, um, uh, thank you for all you do. Uh, just one question. Um, Going into this year, do you have any major themes that the library will be working on as far as, I don't know, adult education or anything of that nature? Any themes? Yeah. Um, well, I, we do have different themes depending on different months. Um, we are looking at starting a nonfiction book club, which is going to cover different topics, uh, different social justice topics um, that, ex that, ex that expand the globe. So we are uh, looking to start that. We were hoping to do it sooner, but we are so busy trying to get the materials out that that's something that we may start um, next month. So the idea is to um, bring different topics uh, to the forefront in, in a book club that we run through the library. Great, okay, thank you. You're welcome. You can learn French right now too. I just saw that. If you wanna learn French, they, they're even offering that. Mm -hmm. This is Um, Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so the services technology position is not part of the initial request. So that, that would be added into there? That is, that is correct. And we didn't in include it um, because we were, we were asked to provide a level services budget. So that's why we did not include it. We just wanted to make sure that we let the town know that the need is still there and, and continues to, to become more important each year. All right. Um, and I just want to thank you. Um, the library is always important, but I can only imagine how much more important it became to people mm -hmm. during COVID when they were housebound. And I'm sure that books became a lot more important to people and, and all the technology you provide. So thank you for being there and thank you for doing such a great job. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Mr. Studo. Uh, no, just uh, no questions. Just comment. Library is great. I've uh, I've enjoyed the uh, between my wife and I the biweekly go pick up the paper bag, at the bottom floor, you know, full of books, which is nice. You know, actually, uh, maybe you guys can keep that forever because just like grocery shopping, I do not like to browse. I just if the bag's ready for me to just take in the car, it's I really prefer it. Um, so, uh, but it's nice. I feel like it especially during the darkest days, as I like to call it, it's nice to have some 
continuity anywhere as small as it is to tell my son that I'm going to get library books. I know it's a small thing, but it's still, it was just a small thing that was normal for lack of a better word. So, you know, getting library books. So no, I thank you. Cause I know that uh, it's, you know, I mean, I mean, talk about a place where you don't know where everybody's touching everything. So I know it was a difficult job. So, um, <laughs> for, yeah, I mean, so, so I, no, I, I, I thank you for that. It, it's uh, underappreciated in the, in, with the internet age, I'll tell you that. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll say the same too. It's the, the library is kind of a hub. I said this to you last year, that the, the amount of programming and just the community hub that you serve as is just tremendous. And I think obviously you had to completely pivot what you were doing providing services, but because you had so much of this already in place for the town, you know, what you, what you offer the community, you know, just that is continuity, like Mr. Studo said, and that's what people needed, right? That's what people need right now. So um, I appreciate everything that you do. And I'd love to see the new, the new, the new programming and hopefully I can get to some of it. <laughs> okay. um, but thank you very much. I'm going to, we're going to go to Finn, FinCom, but I just have one question on that um, tech position. Who is doing that for you right now? Is your assistant director doing that tech service for you? It, it, it is a combination. It is, um, yes, assistant director Dan Tremblay who tries to um, do it and does a great job, but now he's <laughs> been spending a lot of time doing um, um, COVID and guidelines and protocols, but the um, person, the uh, information services reference department, um, Chantil, she also does that. So we all we all do a little bit of it. Um, Matt Cooper, when we could get him over, you know, he, he is split in so many directions, he would do things as well. But it's it's keeping up with the computers inside the building, having a technology plan, is it expanding homebound services, things that we should be doing and really could be doing because there is a request for it and we're just not able to get to it. Well, you gave that list of uh, all the new different, um, I guess online, was yeah. that online services? Yeah. Who identified those for you? And you also listed a grant that you're working with, the transcript on um, digitizing, I guess, their papers. Who, who wrote the grant for you? Who does that work for you? Yeah. So we don't have anyone that writes grants. The um, North Reading Digitization Project is actually used from gift, fund, uh, gift funds, people who have donated oh. money to the library and said that we could use it in any way we see fit. We have um, been asked many times about digitizing the transcript and wanted to do that. Um, leave that legacy. So that is actually from the gift fund, not a grant. It'd be good if, if, if in a better financial period, I know you asked for this before, I think you asked for this position last year as well, but it would be good to have sort of a tech slash grant writing type of a person there because there's, you know, there maybe not now, but there's funding like that available for libraries to just do and uh, you know, even more than what you're doing, but it would be good to kind of have a combination, a person with both skill sets to, to help you out. And that is one but, of the um, job description, part, it is part of it is, is seeking grant opportunities that would be part of that role. Oh, that's that's great. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate you bringing it up. And I was just curious who, who does that. So, um, Mrs. Herbert. Um, Sharon, um, great job as always, but I'm also particularly impressed by the level of creativity that you guys have shown in trying to put together something a little bit out of your normal highway of services for uh, the community during this period of time. So really very clever and very creative and great. I, I appreciate that very much. And I really wanna commend the staff because in order to keep people connected, um, most staff really got out of their comfort zone and started creating one minute, two minute videos, highlighting the collection or doing how to with it. And, and at first everyone, you know, that's not something people were comfortable with, but they, they were able to get, get past that and, and stay connected to people. So yeah, the staff has been really creative trying to find ways to do that. So thank you. Right. Mr. Gamer. <clears throat> no questions, just um, echo what others have said. I, I've seen firsthand how efficient you run things, Sharon, over there. So appreciate all that you do. And uh, this is another department where it's had to run level. 
uh, year over year for quite so, some time. So, you know, hopefully in future years, we'll be able to do more and uh, definitely appreciate you doing everything you can uh, with this type of budget. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson. Uh, no questions. I'm a fan of the library. So glad that on all that they're doing. Thank you. Mr. Hegarty. No questions. Okay. Mr. Bailey. Just um, thanks for including my picture on the last slide. Now, now people know that I read. <laughs> I think I asked permission, didn't I? <laughs> well, we hope you read on the finance you, you, committee. You did. <laughs> we hope you prolifically read on the finance committee. Mr. Kelleher. A nice job, Sharon. Uh, keep, keep, keep up the good work. I think you're doing, doing good stuff. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mills. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next um, budget is conservation. And we have our conservation commission chair with us. Ms. Mitchner, I think you're muted. Yes, you're muted. How about now? There we go. Good. We're welcome. Thank you. Uh, this going to be a tough act to follow. So I have the, the shortest text, the lamest PowerPoint, which I'd be happy to not show you and just tell you what we've done. Um, I can put it up if you prefer to look at it. Sure, you did it. So you might as well show us. I don't know. You might change your mind, but never <laughs> If you can. I'm, it's not like I do this every day. Now, now I'm on the other side and I don't know what I'm doing. There we go. Oh, all right. So not to give it away, but you probably already saw that that was two slides. So we have had a rather normal year, which I think is probably something that not many of the, the boards can say. Um, really our, our only big switch, of course, was to having Zoom meetings. But aside from that, we still maintained uh, our, our once monthly meetings. We had 43 notice of intents. I think we only had two enforcement orders this year and a handful, I think um, 12 uh, certificates of compliance that didn't sound right, that's what my notes say. So, we still maintain a good relationship with CPC. This year, we didn't have a lot of big projects, but we had sort of our, our bread and butter with you know septic systems and pools and, and new houses. We didn't have any large you know, subdivisions coming in. I think a lot of that stuff got put on hold. We anticipate that as you know the vaccine becomes more widely available, we'll see more of that happening and as it can in a town like this where we have sort of limited space that's left, all the, the big parcels are, are becoming more and more scarce. So we have requested level funding, as you can see here. Um, really our only expenditures are standard office supplies. You know, we're not going out and buying everybody iPads, just stuff to run the office. We all have um, uh, Massachusetts Conservation Commission membership dues that have to be paid that the, the town takes. And our commissioners, some of, we've had a lot of turnover this year. Um, I think I'm like the only member that has been there more than a year and a half right now. Um, so a lot of our new commissioners have been really um, enthusiastic about taking some of the, the courses that are offered at the state level, um, which I think is fantastic. So we've been paying out um, fees for them to take courses so they can better serve the community. Um, but, but short of that, we don't have any ongoing projects or, or new projects that are going to demand capital. So we are simply requesting level funding on through 2022. Um, we, you know, we have two part-time employees. We have the administrative assistant and the conservation agent, as I mentioned, both of whom are, are part-time. So 
you know, five member board, two part-time employees, pretty, pretty small budget and pretty small department to make sure that the wetlands are protected. So like I said, just gonna be the PowerPoint that you saw. Um, Short and sweet, we appreciate that. Let's see if anyone has any questions, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, no questions, comments, but uh, more comments than anything else. Again, it is, uh, as Laurie pointed out, we have uh, new membership over the last two years, a significant new membership. We had some long-term, long-serving individuals uh, who uh, left the commission and uh, multiple applicants to, uh, to succeed them, which was heartening uh, because for years there was little or no interest in it. Now there's a significant amount, so that's, that's it's heartening. Uh, but again, you know, if we can uh, assist them with education, we should be supporting that uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, additionally, maybe the town administrator can comment on this. You know, we have uh, for years been pretty level funded as far as, um, um, you know, as far as Leah's position. And that needed an adjustment, which I don't necessarily see reflected here. Maybe you can correct me if I miss something. Uh, but if it hasn't been, it needs to be. Uh, because she's been operating with a level services contract for ages and there needs to be an adjustment there. So maybe if the town administrator could assist me in understanding that a little bit better, make sure that we got that, got that covered. Through you, through you, Madam Chair. So uh, yes, there, there was a, um, a multiple month period during the course of late last year where we had temporarily increased the number of hours for the administrative assistant in the office and um, believe that that ended up being able to be suspended in either December or January. I'm just going from the top of my head. And um, I see Liz is nodding favorably. Um, you know, I, it, to Ms. Mishner, you know, this is something that I think we want to keep an eye on, particularly as activity might ramp back up in the, in the early part of the spring. So when we come to the point of reconciling the budget, we'll, we'll look at that again and see if there's any need for an adjustment that needs to be made based on the, on the workload. But um, Mr. Leary, you're absolutely correct. There was a, you know, a marked market increase in activity and a required increase in the staffing in the, in the office in particular. <clears throat> and that's reflected, in, is that reflected in the budget request or not? It is not, it does not appear to be. Okay, so I think the board should be made aware that we can anticipate um, probably a final reconciliation moving forward in this particular area to support the efforts of the Conservation Commission and their mission and what they need to do and what they need to adjust just on uh, statutory requirements. Uh, just need to be made aware of it that probably <coughs> what's being requested is going to be uh, not enough to meet the, the obligations. And maybe we could just have an idea as to what we're talking about. Again, it's not a lot of money, but um, you know, I don't, I don't know what the number is. Is I don't know if um, is Rourke, Is there anything you want to add to that, or, or Gilberto? Is there anything you want to add to that, Miss Miss Rock? Oh, we can't uh, hear there you go again, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> If it helps, it says you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Uh, all right. Just give, Liz is gonna call us. Yeah, but, but the fact of the matter is, is there's gonna be some increased uh, uh, needs, resources needed uh, to support just uh, daily operations and weekly operations of the of the Conservation Commission and, and their efforts uh, ongoing anyway. So level funded probably is not realistic. I think that the, the short answer would be that, you know, it, it's likely that we, we're gonna need to adjust this. You see that there is an increase that went in, you know, we, we spoke about the administrative staff in the office. There has been an increase with regard to the hourly rate of the, um, of the conservation agent. You'll see that, as you can see in the request, there was an increase in there in FY21, and that's carried through with FY22. Again, another area that we'll monitor the performance between now and when we reconcile the budget, most likely in, uh, in uh, the, either the first or second week of April. And thank you, Liz. 
<laughs> She's back. Liz, are you there? Yes. Did you, did you hear what I offered? Did you want to add anything to it? <laughs> I heard the end of it. So you uh, you answered how I was clarifying uh, Mr. O'Leary's question. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roth. Okay. All set, Mr. O'Leary? Yes. Uh, Laurie, and thank you for all your efforts and everybody else that's on the commission for what they do all year round. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Gonzalez. I have no questions, but um, just a thank you for all that you do. Okay. Mr. Walner? Yeah, um, I, uh, I've known Lori for a long time and I'm glad she's on the CONCOM because I had to make a request about a year and a half ago and she handled me very professionally, I must say. So I can only ex ex express my thanks from a consumer point of view. So thank you for what you do. Mr. Mr. Studo. No questions, just thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you from the chair. You look like you're on a ski lift somewhere too. It looks very relaxing and peaceful. We're going to call the <laughs> finance committee. Mrs. Hurlbut, any questions, comments? Mr. Gamer? No questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Mr. Johnson? No questions at this time. Thank you. Mr. Haggerty? Oh, he was with us. All right. Mr. Bailey. All set. Thanks. Okay. Mr. Kelleher. No questions. Thank you. Mr. Mills. No questions for me either. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I don't know how we put Board of Health in the middle here. We probably should have put you at the end <laughs> to give you the most time, but Mr. Bracey, welcome. Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, of course. Yes. All right. Thank you. Madam Chair, through you uh, to all the various boards uh, and chairs and, and department heads here, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for the health department to give this uh, brief uh, presentation on our budget. Uh, at this time, the health department would be requesting a uh, level funded budget. Uh, and if I may, uh, through you, Madam Chair, if I could share my screen. Sure, yes. Uh, let me pull this up. Everybody see that okay? Yep. Uh, okay, so I, I will begin uh, the Board of Health presentation. So uh, as uh, the outline to our budget this evening will be obviously the Board of Health mission statement, our FY21 notable achievements, COVID-19, uh, health department permits issued and reviewed, performance workload indicators, um, and uh, FY22 budget analysis. Uh, the Board of Health uh, mission statement is to educate, promote, improve, and protect the public health and well-being of the citizens of the town of North Reading, while contributing to a uh, healthy community and environment in which we all live. Uh, our current mission, as we all know, with this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, is to monitor, manage, and prioritize the COVID-19 pandemic and response in the town of North Reading. Uh, also to inform, educate, and empower uh, the residents of North Reading on COVID-19 virus. Also to continue to evaluate effectiveness, accessibility, and the quality of population based on health services. Uh, example of that is, is to have uh, vaccination clinics here for our residents. Uh, that is the current uh, mission statement for the Board of Health. Uh, our 21 notable achievements, as you can see, and I'll, I'll run through these relatively quick, uh, Again, based on the COVID-19, uh, allowed the town uh, a Board of Health to issue a declaration of emergency uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, through that declaration of emergency, uh, allowed the Board of Health and the Health Department to issue uh, emergency orders, sector-specific workplace safety standards, uh, direction and guidance for the protection of the health and well-being of, our, of the North Reading residents, transient residents, employees, schools, businesses, restaurants, conjugate care facilities, daycare facility, nursing homes, and places of worship. Also through uh, you know, the uh, declaration of emergency, um, the health department activated its emergency dispensing site and its incident command structure 
uh, to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we did, uh, the health department and the Board of Health did submit uh, a regional COVID-19 regional dispensing site uh, through the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Uh, we also, during the COVID uh, pandemic, we secured uh, funding through the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Area Council uh, and other state and federally funded uh, resources. Other notable achievements, uh, again, through administration, food protection and environmental health, uh, we implemented uh, sector specific workplace standards, uh, food protection, uh, we activated a new uh, food protection software system. Um, community health uh, really was, was the biggest uh, notable achievements uh, here in town, we hired a new public health nurse. Uh, we were able through uh, the uh, finance committee, town administrator and director of public safety to purchase a new pharmaceutical grade vaccination fridge. Uh, we also developed community influenza programs with CVS and Walmart. Uh, more importantly, we developed and implemented a influenza vaccine program uh, to bring the influenza program to the North Reading schools uh, to meet code compliance with the regulation to mandate all school aged children. Uh, other implementations through community health again was to implement sector specific workplace safety standards for retail businesses uh, in North Reading. Uh, all the while we were able to maintain code compliance with several Ma uh, Massachusetts state sanitary codes uh, for housing, uh, lead prevention, recreational for camps, uh, standards for swimming pools, Tannin salons and investigation of public nuisances. Uh, COVID-19, uh, I put a nice graph on here for folks to see uh, the kind of ride that we kind of took in uh, over the last year from January to January 20th to January 21. You can see early in April and May, um, we had a little bit of a spike and then we kind of leveled out a little bit and then we got that second surge uh, back in October, November. And as you can see, we're starting to decline on the cases here in the community. Uh, COVID-19 clinics, uh, we have currently have done uh, nine first dose clinics. Uh, we have two pending clinics uh, coming up this week, Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, we have done uh, four second dose clinics for first responders and we have seven pending second dose clinics uh, coming up in the month of March. Uh, that will have given us 22 COVID-19 clinics uh, that we have administered here in the town of North Reading. The amount of doses that we've administered up until this point um, will, is, is roughly about 505 vaccinations. Um, 65 of those, again, were second doses to first responders uh, with a total uh, after uh, all 22 clinics um, will be roughly about 570 uh, clinic uh, vaccines, vaccines that were administered, sorry. Uh, we broke it out down into COVID-19 vaccination by populations, uh, given uh, the vaccinations that were uh, given to us by DPH. As you can see from this graph, uh, first responders, we did 65. Uh, 75 and older, we did 169. Uh, 65 and older, we did 235. Uh, folks with two or more comorbidities, we did 64. And other 37, meaning uh, clinical staff, volunteers uh, that have helped out with the clinics. Health department permits issued this year, we issued uh, 508 permits. Um, I gave the breakdown here of the permits that we generally issue on an annual basis. Health department permits uh, applications reviewed. Again, we issued 500 per, 508 permits and reviewed 712 building department permits. Comparison of uh, performance workload indicators. Um, I put this in here just to uh, indicate that uh, you know, we did have some increased hours uh, with the public health nurse last year. Um, but just to note that, again, I think what's important to note here is that with the COVID-19, um, there's going to be a significant increase in workload uh, with the health department with some of these COVID-19 sector-specific workplace safety standards becoming uh, 
Massachusetts State Sanitary Codes. So that's just an indicator of that the workload will be increasing with the health department uh, over the next year or so. Um, with that being said, the Board of Health budget has relatively stayed the same uh, over the last three years. The only decrease in uh, the department budget uh, from FY 21 to 22 uh, was the decrease in the administrative assistant salary uh, going from a new hire last year uh, from the previous um, administrative assistant. The FY 22 goals uh, going into next season will be management of the COVID-19 uh, through the health department uh, to lead the community through the COVID-19 pandemic Again, to monitor, manage, prioritize the COVID-19 pandemic uh, by informing, educating, empowering residents, uh, by continuing to evaluate the effectiveness, accessibility, and quality control based on public health services. Uh, also uh, to work with the public health nurse to expand community public health services uh, through the community impact team, counseling aging in the North Reading schools. Uh, also to seek opportunities through state and federal funding to expand uh, special services and food septic inspections uh, and to continue to implement the 10 essential functions of public health for the betterment of the town of North Reading. And that was it. Sorry to be so quick. I had five minutes. That's great. Let's see if we have, that was pretty concise. Let's see if we have any questions or comments. Mr. O'Leary. Well, you know, last week we had a terrific presentation as to uh, what's occurred in relation to the clinics. But, you know, if there's any department that's had to uh, make adjustments over the last year, it's certainly been uh, the, the, the health department. Um, their, their responsibilities have not diminished one bit. You know, they still have all the oversight and all the uh, concerns that they have in relation to, you know, establishments, eating establishments, uh, septic systems, the new permitting, the whole nine yards. And in addition to that, had to take on uh, this whole responsibility in relation to the pandemic and has uh, certainly risen to uh, the challenges. I mean, we were prepared, you know, the, thanks to Mr. Bracey, uh, the health department themselves, the uh, Board of Health, the administration, the finance committee, this particular board, select board and their support, uh, we were ready to address the needs of the community when it came to having a uh, vaccination site here in North Reading and uh, rose to the occasion and did a fantastic job. Uh, again, state made a decision to uh, pull the rug out from underneath us, but that's another issue that we discussed last week. But um, again, this is the time and opportunity to uh, again recognize uh, the efforts of everybody. This is not uh, something within a 35 or 40 hour work week uh, that was able to address it. These people put in a substantial amount of time and effort and energy along with a significant number of volunteers uh, from our administrative staff and from the community to, to meet the challenges uh, that we've had. So um, kudos to everybody. Um, kudos going forward because it's not over and uh, you know, what you've done and what you continue to do is gre greatly appreciated. Um, and, you know, keep up the good work and whatever support you need, I know you have it, you know, from our board, finance committee, the community as a whole. And uh, the feedback has been phenomenal as far as the uh, vaccination site up at Hillview, nothing but positive reviews and appreciation for, uh, you know, what's, what's happened there. And uh, hopefully the, the state's uh, the state sees um, the value of handling things at a local level and we're able to uh, reinstitute it and move forward going forward as far as the vaccination process. But again, uh, Bob, uh, thank you. And I don't know if Gary's here or not, but the, the Board of Health, uh, Stephanie, and the, to the Administration and Finance Committee and all the volunteers uh, throughout the administration. Once again, a lot of people, a lot of employees stepped up from other departments to assist them uh, to meet the needs. So uh, congratulations, thank you very much. Uh, greatly appreciated and keep up the good work and let me know what you need because you have you have our support. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mrs. Gonzalez. Bob, I mean, what more can I say, Mr. O'Leary? 
pretty much said it all there. Um, I mean, you, you took on a pandemic and let us all feel safe. You know, you've done a phenomenal job. My in-laws were able to access their vaccines at the Hillview and couldn't say enough about the staff and, and how wonderful it was. I work in town. I've heard it from other people who have just told me how seamless it was and how wonderful the staff was. And so, you know, just, you know, applause to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Walner. I really didn't know much about your, the Board of Health until just the last week. And now I realize how thick it really is. So thank you for all you do and for uh, taking care of our citizens the way you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strudel. Um, it's already been said, rather than me repeat it and go through another five minutes, I, I, it, it, everything I want to say has been said. So I'm going to say thank you for your work. Okay. I'll say the same. I'm just going to say ditto. Um, I just have one quick question on your, um, your presentation. I don't even know if you tracked this, Mr. Bracey. Did the number of permits decrease? It, it looked like you had a pretty significant number of permits that you still issued during the pandemic. Was that low, lesser than what you had anticipated? I'm not sure if you even tracked it. Yeah, so we, we had less of permits this year due to COVID-19. Um, generally during the summertime, we'll get a lot of temporary food uh, applications um, for festivals or events, and, and we, we didn't have those uh, this year um, due to the COVID. Okay. All right. and, and Madam Chair, if I may, just in closing, if it's okay. Sure. Uh, well, the finance has, I have to pull the finance to <laughs> not done yet but we'll let you have we'll let you speak at the end just in case other people have but okay. we know we just we really appreciate the tremendous job you the board you and the board of health do for the town and um steve's been get mr o'leary's been giving us the regular updates as the liaison you just kind of mobilized and went into high gear and like mrs gonzalez said you helped us to have that sense of safety and security that we needed as a town. And we know you were ready for this and could handle it and tackle it and everything else that, that came your way. So we just, I'm just gonna echo what everyone said and say, thank you. But let me just ask the finance committee if they have any questions. Mrs. Hurlbut. Um, I don't have any questions, but Bob, thanks for all your gang has been doing over the past year and before that. Mr. Gamer. Just awesome, awesome job. And just let us know what you need going forward to keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Uh, no specific questions. Just that um, I know I was glad that I know one, one of my family members was able to <clears throat> get over there, which was difficult for a senior. So appreciate how the work you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hegarty, I think he's not with us, right, Mr. Gilberto? Mr. Hegarty, on with us anymore? He has bounced out and then was back in last I saw, but it looks like he may be back out again, yeah. All right, Mr. Bailey. No questions, thank you. Mr. Kelleher. Uh, no questions, thank you for what you're doing, Bob. Thank you. Mr. Mills. Uh, I just want to thank you for all your hard work and I uh, don't have any call comments. Thank you. Mr. Bracey, back to you. So just what, before I... Mr. Uh, O'Leary. One more comment. Uh, just as a matter of feedback, something other than COVID. Uh, again, you know, it's a difficult task to oversee the local restaurants, the business establishments and the community. And I actually went into a local establishment who... Uh, pulled me, the, the owner pulled me aside uh, to say, listen, you know, Mr. Bracey came in here. He told me I had to do these things. Uh, it cost me some money. And he said, but I need to say this to you right now, because uh, by the way, he had complained to me previously when Bob had put the order in place or the suggestions, strong suggestions in place. <laughs> he, he had complained to me previously. He said, what he suggested, you know, I complied with, 
and oh my God, it works. It's more efficient. It's safer. And he was right. I was wrong. Um, I just want to tell you that. That's what he told me. So Bob, Thank you. kudos to you. Not easy, not an easy task to, uh, and this is aside from the COVID, you put me in regular daily operations, a uh, local establishment owner pulled me aside just two weeks ago to tell me that. And I just figured I would make that comment today. So continue your good work and you know how you're going to manage moving forward uh, with what's required in this COVID thing and still do the business that you need to do. You know, I don't know how, but good luck. <laughs> you have our support and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Larry, Mr. Bracey. Madam Chair, thank you. And I just wanted to do some closing remarks and I'd be remiss if I didn't say these things. Um, you know, to say that this was a completely health department effort, um, I, I would be remiss to say that it, it's truly not. Um, this was truly a collaborative effort. This was a team effort um, uh, from the many volunteers, uh, support staff that we had here at Town Hall through Youth Services, Council on Aging, Planning Department. Um, you know, I, I can't thank them enough. Um, you know, the school department, the school nurses, um, you know, really the weekly meetings that we had with, you know, the Director of Public Safety, the Town Administrator, the Fire Chief, finance director. Um, these were all people who supported um, this collaboration. And this truly was a community effort, uh, hands down. And, and I can't thank enough, um, you know, the town administrator and the director of public safety for their support, uh, truly. Um, but I would also be remiss if I didn't thank my staff. Um, you know, the Board of Health members, uh, Pam Bath, who we, we burnt the candle on both ends, um, and really the administrative assistant, Stephanie, who has kind of kept us all together. But uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank those people and the support that they gave uh, to the health department, but more importantly, um, the residents of this community for their understanding and their patience during this time. Um, really, I applaud them for, for everything. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bracey. Okay, we have next we have code enforcement and ZBA. Well, it looks like Director okay, Bracey. Oh, welcome. Our building commissioner with us. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, Select Board, Mr. Gilbert, Gilberto, and uh, FinCon. I just want to, uh, I don't want to say once again that. Mr. Bracey is a very tough act to follow. But with that said, um, I'm gonna have Bob turn that down. Um, the, the North Reading Building Department uh, board presentation. I'm Jerry Noel, the building commissioner. This is my, my presentation for FY 2022. And I'll let you share that right now. Can we all see that? Yes. Okay, I was having a tough time with that earlier. Okay, so my presentation overview is going to be of the building department's mission, notable achievements, performance workload indicators, FY22 budget statement, and FY22 uh, goals and achieved and, and objectives. The building department's mission. The building department's mission is to protect the lives and safety of all residents and vi visitors through code compliance with proper construction methods. Notable accomplishments and growth for 2020. Uh, Pulte is currently on its fourth building. We issued 1,935 permits and with our fee increase, we we're able to generate an additional $55,000 from the previous year. Implementation of the new software has allowed uh, our staff to work remotely, and that also has allowed um, applicants to apply remotely. Performance workload indicators. Building department consists of one, one admin, one assistant inspector, uh, three part-time plumbing inspectors, one part-time electrical inspector, one sealer of weights and measures, and one commissioner. Budget statement. 
looking for, the department is looking for 10,400 in funds, but one per diem electrical inspector. As we lost our backup inspector the previous year, and we are looking to keep the community's needs satisfied. Permit fees and inspection revenue. FY22 budget reflects the requirements to meet the growing needs of the community. Oh, did I miss one here? Yeah, right there, sorry, I went, went ahead. Permit fees and inspection revenue. As previously stated, we collected over $55,000 over the previous re uh, year's revenue. This is partly due to a fee increase. Our total fees collected is $581,691. This chart, you will note that the larger shade larger of green, shade green is the building, the building, the building permits and the next largest is the electrical. And you'll see, you'll, you'll note the plumbing, gas, and HVAC. This, the, for the new permits for, for the year, we had 712 total. That's just building permits, that's not collectively. We've had a total of 2% more permits than last year. And that's a total of 30, 36 more permits um, issued, which is uh, from with the pandemic that we had, this that was quite an achievement for this department. Two thousand nineteen versus uh, twenty twenty permits. This indicates the total number of permits for all disciplines. As you'll see, eight hundred and twenty four for building. Electrical, we went we went down a little bit. Plumbing, same. Plumbing, we went up. Gas, we went down. HVAC, we went down as well. But, uh, <clears throat> inspections. As you can see that there that we that <clears throat> there were less inspections, but this was due to COVID, combining some inspections into one with pictures and videos as we applied best practice, eliminating the amount of time we went out to perform physical inspections. Once again, this was due to the pandemic. Goals and objectives. Um, our first goal would be to secure an, an electrical inspector. Um, we, we need to meet the needs of the community. Um, especially the residents and the businesses. Uh, continue with the progress of the building department. Continue the cost, cost effective and maximize, maximize staff efficiency. Sustain awareness for all applicants regarding code changes that may affect their projects. Um, applicants have been using online permitting system and it's been doing, it's been doing absolutely fantastic. Um, Kathy Morgan has been absolutely stellar with this and she's been really pushing these applicants to, to make sure they get um, everything they need relative to the, the permitting system. Um, and that, that's uh, pretty much uh, my FY 2022 budget. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Um, we'll start with Mr. O'Leary. Gary, thank you for all that you do. And again, it's been challenging in relation to the inspectional services part of it, you know, being on site, but um, also, with the passing of Al DeSalvo, you and your staff have had to, you know, pick up the, the, the slack. And I know Al's presence is deeply missed. Um, but I, I also know that just from what I do here now, it's tax season. Um, new permits for, you know, additions and improvements to people's homes. Since people are hanging around, there, they're noticing more things that need to be done around their home. And uh, I have more people now... Um, looking for energy efficiency uh, credits on their tax return. So, you know, I appreciate all, all that's being done, uh, you're picking up the slack in the absence of Al. And, and in, in relation to uh, Al's passing, uh, do we see, we don't see a need at this particular point in time to uh, add additional hours or an assistant uh, uh, building inspector? Uh, right now, we're, we're able to manage it and we're able to handle this. Um, Inspector Anzalone, um, 
he has been absolutely stellar. I can't uh, have to speak volumes of him as as recently he just passed his test. He is now a certified building inspector. Um, so the building department as a whole has been, you know, has continued to work hard and they've continued to work hard ethically. And I'm, you know, I'm very proud of them. Well, that's, uh, that's good to hear again. I appreciate all the effort and the additional time and uh, energy that you're putting in uh, to pick up uh, pick up the difference that, that's needed with Al's passing. And, and again, th there's no doubt the permit the permits are not going away. Uh, people are still making improvements. And again, for your efforts and and um, Kathy and everybody else in your office, uh, appreciate very much what's being done and how you're doing it and how you're handling it. Again, uh, again, I've also heard from people in the community uh, who have had permits pending, uh, been handled on a timely basis, and you know the interaction has been very positive. And you know, kudos to you and and your department for how you're handling things. Appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner. Um, again, I'm learning from Steve now what goes on there, and from hearing what you have to say. So I appreciate you you know, being flexible during the pandemic and keeping going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Studer. Um, yes, uh, Gary, just a quick question. Well, a couple. Um, so I see that the building, building permits are up. So that building permits encompass what, um, what people want to do their existing home. Does that also include like new construction permits That's for it. new homes? Yes. Okay. Do you, do you have the number handy? I mean, we can even take it offline of how much that is for new construction, single family. How many new single family homes there are? Well, no, no, the building permits for how many, how many of those building permits accounted for those last year? If you have that. I have it right here. And building, building permits for last year was 670, 76. This year is 712. This okay, seven hundred and twelve. Seven hundred and twelve this year, but that just permits. That doesn't include permits. That, that that does not include all permit activity. That doesn't include um, relative to all disciplines. Okay. If you look at the, the total amount of permits that we had, um, we had one thousand nine hundred and thirty-five permits collectively. Oh, I was just, yeah, no, I was just curious uh, out of the building permits of how many were for actual uh, new construction of homes rather than just renovations or what have you. So that got me that answer. And um, and then you a question here. And roughly 17. 17. 17? 17, roughly, yeah. For this coming year? Or for last, last year? For last, last year. This okay. coming year, we have... Uh, we have quite a few developments. We had uh, Eaton Circle. Um, we have Crest Crestview Estates. Um, we have Shea Lane, uh, Woodcutter Lane, which is 77 Elm Street, which they've already they, they just started the retaining wall over there. Um, we have the Charles uh, Street. Extension. Excuse me. No, I saw that. I, I live right by there. Yep. Okay. And of course right. we have the. The Pulte project, which is, uh, you know, nine buildings co collectively. Of course. Okay. No, thank you. And then, oh, actually, one last question. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. And I don't know if this is, uh, and again, being newer to this, like Mr. Walner said a lot, I'm kind of learning on the fly. But how, um, when a when a permit's uh, pulled for new construction, um, how is it almost 100% they get billed, or there's some that fall on the wayside that do not get billed after all? Out of all of them that get that, no, I, I would say all of them get built. Okay. Unless they have any zoning issues, but usually, usually they don't. Okay. We that. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez. Hi. Um, I just have one question. I'm having technology issues here. So um, you were saying that you need a an electrical inspector. Is that what you were? That is correct. Uh, an assistant electrical inspector. What do you, is there a cost on that? Is there? $10,400. Okay, that's what I was looking for. 
-hmm. and we it's really difficult we can't share other communities electrical inspectors reason being is they're in the same predicament as we are um they can't find anybody and a lot of these electrical inspectors in these other communities are are all retired so it's just very difficult to um try to try to secure them to come here and our electrical inspector can't even take time off he can't take a vacation um mm. so he's he's basically stuck here so and he's been doing this job for two years straight without taking any time off whatsoever okay all right I, thank you I thank you very um, I just had a couple of questions too for you before we get to FinCom. When you gave us that breakdown of the number of permits um, between 20, uh, 2019 and 2020, is that what you gave us or am I in the wrong? Was I in the wrong year? No, 2019 and 2020. That's correct. Okay. So it, is, it was that over the same period of time that you correct. were tracking it? One year. One year. That is correct. Okay. And then I had the, I also had the question that I wanted to follow up on um, Mrs. Gonzalez's question on the assi assistant electrical engineer. So right now you just have that one person. I think you asked us for this last year as well. So we did, did, but you, we so did, but we took it out of the, the budget because I, I think because of the pandemic. Right. But I do know that we do need this desperately. And you haven't seen a decrease in the, okay. Well, you haven't seen a decrease in that. <laughs> oh, no. You haven't seen a decrease in the, nest, the number of electrical inspe inspections that are required, right? Well, even if there was a decrease in the number of electrical inspecting, inspections that are required, um, how would I fill that position when this electrical inspector goes on vacation? I need to meet the residents' needs. And I need to meet the community's needs at, um, as a whole. No, I, I was basically asking you just about the number of electrical permits, though. I, I understand the employment issue. I was just wondering, have you seen a decrease in the number of electrical inspections? Electrical permits this past year, we did see a decrease. It, it, we've seen roughly uh, 30, 31, 31 less. So that was uh, 464 electrical permits. Okay. And electrical inspections, we did have a decrease. Once again, we had a decrease because of the pandemic. We basically relied on pictures and videos. Mm -hmm. okay. So it was, uh, I mean, we could include those pictures and videos as, the, as part of the inspection process, but it, it wasn't an actual physical inspection. Okay. Ms. Ms. Rourke, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, but we're probably wondering how you just said, Ms. Rourke, go ahead. Hopefully my- Oh, uh, we can hear you. <laughs> I'll, I'll let um, the town administrator speak to it, but you hit it right on um, the head in regards to the position. This position has existed um, since I've been with the town for over nine and a half years. There's been two um, assistant electrical um, inspectors. However, last year, due to um, budget constraints, it was cut from the budget. And the amount um, was 25,000 plus uh, for the position. And the public safety director, along with the building inspector, determined that 10,400 would achieve the needs um, as the building inspector just explained. Well, no, I was I'm wondering about that because if it's, what does that give us? Does that give us 10 hours a week? Does that give us five hours a week? Does that give us five inspections a week? What exactly would that, doesn't seem like a lot of money. So I understand to offset someone's work schedule and give someone a vacation, which I hope we're giving the gentleman a vacation anyway, he's entitled to it. But what, how are we, what does that give us in terms of that figure? I'm looking at this between, uh depending on what we pay this individual, um, and we have to come down, you know, figure that out. We're looking anywhere between, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the town administrator between 30 and 50 an hour, it's gonna be difficult to try to get somebody on board without paying them a, a, a decent salary. Well, it's, it's gonna be near impossible. Um, I know the other surrounding communities are having the same, same issues as we are. Um, so uh, the amount of hours, I'm, I'm hoping that this covers at least uh, 
a minimum of, uh, I, I think if Mike, Mike Murphy is out there, um, I think we said about a hundred hours, Mike. I don't know if he's there. Madam Chair, uh, it comes to about 15 hours a week based upon 35 hours, $35 an hour. Okay. All right, that's uh, okay. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Hurlbut, questions? All set? Mr. Gamer? No questions here. Mr. Johnson? No questions, thank you. Mr. Hegarty? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Bailey is not with No us. questions. Mr. Kelleher? No questions. Mr. Mills? Um, so I thought the figure was uh, 10-4, 10,400. Is that what the, uh, so it looks like on the page, oh, I don't have a page number, page 260 on the spreadsheet, on the uh, PDF file. I like the vacant position was allocated at eight hours a week at $25 an hour. So there might need to be some adjustment to that or just to look at that a little bit closer. Other than that, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mr. O'Leary. I know that begs for a follow up. I should use Mr. this real thing to raise my hand, but I, keep I can see you. It's all right. I know. Uh, just a couple of th a couple of uh, points. Well, uh, one is, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank the building commissioner for um, working with the Pulte people uh, to facilitate the continuing building of that facility. And I know it's been a challenge. And uh, the faster it gets built, the more revenue we have coming into the town. And you know, it, they have met some challenges. And, and thank you for working with them, with them to uh, to get that facilitated. Again, as far as the uh, the inspectional services and what's happening, as far as the, the de decrease in actual visitations, there is no doubt that the pictures and videos that are forwarded to the department should be categorized as inspections because you know it's, it's as if they were there. Uh, and, and in relation to the ten thousand four hundred dollars, uh, you know whether it's twenty five dollars an hour, thirty five dollars an hour, depending upon the individual you hire, well, whether it's 15 hours or 12 hours a week, um, obviously it's necessary. And it's half of what we were paying just two years ago in relation to uh, meeting the needs of the community before that. So, you know, I'm supportive of, of the position uh, at $10,400. Uh, and again, get the best possible candidate. And, and I know it's challenging uh, to get candidates to, to come forward and, and, and work for a part-time position for the community. So I applaud your efforts, appreciate your efforts and uh, appreciate everything you're doing to meeting the needs. And again, once again, the, 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 the feedback from the community has been extremely positive. So thank you for that. Thank you. I just wanna just, I think Ms. Rourke is gonna clar just clarify the, if I can recognize Ms. Rourke, appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, what, was discussed between the public safety director, the town administrator, and the building inspector was to put a lump sum of $10,400 um, within the budget. Uh, the old hourly rate was left within the, the spreadsheet uh, by error. However, you know, one week if the other electrical inspector is on vacation, you know, this individual could work 20 hours. Um, the next week, five hours may only be needed. Uh, so that is what the thought process was. There's no particular set hours per week for this individual. So those figures were um, formulas that were, were left in from the, the previous uh, oh. spreadsheet. So the, it's a lump sum of $10,400 to be spent over the course of FY22. So I, I hope that clarify some things, um, you know, and we, we don't know what the hourly rate will be yet. Uh, we don't know what the candidacy pool will be yet. And we don't know what, you know, one particular week's need will be. However, it will not 
go over uh, 19 and a half hours in order to, it will not be a benefited position basically. So, you know, that, that's, that's the goal. Okay. It, it, so that, in other words, it's not, you're not bringing someone on as a part-time employee. It's almost like you're just, you need, you're need you going to need someone who's per diem, per diem or per, per job or just moonlighting as is it. It seems like if other people are having this struggle, you maybe we should talk to the other communities. Everyone can throw 10,400 into a pool and they, the person he or she can work one day for each of us, you know, for the, for the five days a week, you know, it seems like it's, you know, if everyone's struggling, it seems like we're all in the same boat. Maybe people, maybe if we don't have the funds to bring someone on as a regular, either part-time employee, regularly employed or full-time employee, maybe that's the route to go to see if there's some sort of, you know, I don't know if you've explored that, but maybe that, maybe we could explore that shared, a shared employee amongst the towns in this manner, in this per diem manner, you know. Um, all right. So if there's nothing else, I think we're good. Thank you for, uh, thank you, Mr. Noel. We appreciate it. Thank All you. Set. Thank okay. you. And our next um, budget is the town clerk, and we have clerk stats with us. Welcome. You're muted. Hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay, good enough. I'm never sure if my audio is working. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to just begin, as everyone else has, to say what an extraordinary year it has been, and to thank all of the people that have worked to make all of the events and the um, functioning of our office successful under these very trying circumstances. I have to thank Assistant Town Clerk Janet Murphy and uh, my longtime staff member, Carol Ducro because they have worked tirelessly this whole year in making sure that our regular office functions continue as well as these extraordinary elections and town meetings that have taken place. On top of that, we have to recognize um, that we have an extraordinary pool of election workers who are so dedicated to the town and have you know, come forward to continue to work during these circumstances, even though so many of them were in the category of, of most uh, vulnerable citizens under the pandemic conditions. And yet their first thoughts were to continue to work for the town, to make the election processes work. Um, I, I cannot understate or overstate their value to the election process this year. We have many People, we have, you know, generally speaking, a, a steady pool of 70 election workers. And this year, totally unsolicited, I was getting volunteers stepping forward to help us out, especially with the presidential election, in doing anything that was needed to make that election happen uh, safely and successfully. And we utilized almost everybody that steps forward to help us in that regard. The contributions by everyone were just tremendous. And it really was a joint effort with all of the staff. Um, it was uh, quite a collaborative effort with other departments, with the DPW for helping us set up, with the public safety director, with the fire chief. I mean, to make all of this happen when we're talking about uh, running um, mandatory required elections and town meetings under very strenuous and um, unpredictable circumstances and uh, trying to keep everyone safe, not just the uh, participants, but those who worked within the system. So it was, it is a credit to everybody that I will say we had a very successful year. Um, that being said, you know, again, I have to backtrack to my office staff because in addition to just running all those events, um, we also had to maintain our normal work, 
you know, and that includes, you know, being responsive to the public there. They were looking for vital records. There were numerous public records requests, which did not see any relief under the pandemic conditions. There were no leeways given to deadlines for um, many of these things, especially public records requests. People who wanted to continue to get business certificates, um, making sure that everybody was working under the open meeting law and ethics requirements. Um, and something as simple as um, marriage licenses, you know, things that people depend on. We were really one of, uh, not a lot of communities were continuing to issue marriage licenses when we were doing so to make sure that these life events for people could continue. Um, it really made a difference to them. And a lot of that credit goes to our facilities and the town administrator for setting up a very workable uh, public area in the foyer of town hall where we could conduct business with a plexiglass barrier and still maintain that personal contact with the public to continue um, giving them these services that they need. So there was a lot going on this year. There were a lot of adjustments to be made. And I think that everyone stepped up and really um, did their best to make sure that the residents and other members of the public were serviced uh, in the fashion that they're used to and that their needs were met throughout all of this craziness and um, very difficult situation. Um, so I, I just say kudos to everybody who, who worked throughout this. Um, the, Governor did declare that all election offices were considered essential services. I would say that except for at the very beginning when we weren't, we really didn't know what was hitting us with this pandemic and we had to close down just as um, the um, Council on Aging Director said, I mean, we, we got notice that we were, had to close down, just uh, get out, you know, be safe. And then we started to come back. I don't think that my office was closed one day. There was a continuing rotation of staff to meet the needs of the people. And then as we got into our election scenarios in particular, um, we were working every day, every evening, and every weekend just to make sure that we were registering voters, hundreds and hundreds of voters, and we were processing thousands and thousands of mailed ballots, all on very short notice with changing election laws. As many of you have said before, and you've heard from other departments, we didn't know what we were being hit with, but we adapted and we made it happen and it ran successfully. So I just wanna Thank everybody that, that partake, partook in all of these efforts and for all of their work and dedication to make it happen. So it, it, it was no small task. And it wasn't my first rodeo, so I can tell you that it was a year like no other that I've ever seen you know, in my career with the town. So that being said, um, for my budget, if I think Liz has my PowerPoint, and um, the good news is that- Whatever your budget is, I agree with. <laughs> well, you know, I know why- yeah, yeah, Whatever it is, it's good. Down. Whatever it is, it's It good. went down. Down. <laughs> so oh. that's all that, that I, I need to say. We did go down from uh, three elections in this past fiscal year, including one budgeted session of early voting, although we did have in the calendar year to additional uh, unbudgeted sessions of early voting, which as I said, were thrown at us at the last minute by the legislature. And um, uh, so we have just recently received reimbursement actually for the presidential primary, which was one year ago uh, from the state as an unfunded mandate. And we are soon to get our, our questionnaire on our unfunded costs for the last two elections as well. 
but you know, everything in practically everything in my budget did go down because we did go from three elections to one election this coming fiscal year, which will just be the town election in May of 22. And um, uh, the only increase in my budget was for um, servicing of our voting equipment because that did increase by $50 per unit. So I don't know if you even want to see my PowerPoint. Maybe it's it's not needed. Ms. Brock, I think has her hand up. Clark Scott. I was Pardon? I was not sure if you would like me to share my screen for Barbara's presentation. Do you have an? Um, I think you just sure if it, if it's something that you you want us. It just will show the decreases. You know, we can skip right to the pages. Um, I think it was six and seven, Liz. Maybe if you backtrack that one slide. Right there. Oh, yeah. That will just highlight, you know, the three elections in the current fiscal year to one coming up in this, in this budget. Okay. Um, and then the next slide will just show the records budget uh, decreases. As I said in, in past presentations, that our budgets somewhat overlap because many of the costs of an election are also carried in the records budget, such as the just even the first line item repairs and maintenance. That's all our office equipment, and in particular, this one is um, the copier charges. You know, obviously, with three elections, you're going to make more copies. That's a bigger monthly cost. Um, so that being said, that diminishes advertising is reflected in the election notices. Printing is primarily envelopes, the, the thousands of envelopes that we had to order to process all of the election notices that are mandated by the law to send out to every new registrant, every registrant who changes party, and every registrant who moves to another town and registers in another town that we've deleted them. So, and the mailroom postage diminishes um, from the mailing of absentee ballots. Um, that, that a lot of that cost this year was, of course, carried by the state um, for returning ballots to us. That was part of the legislation that was mandated of the Secretary of State. Um, and the office supplies. Um, you know, just diminishes from uh, what we need, you know, in general use based on the fewer elections. Okay. And on the next, oh. the next slide, Liz, are the election decreases. And of course, that pretty much self-explanatory election and town meeting staff salaries diminish office staff over time. The, um, the, the one increase there, repairs and maintenance for the um, AccuVote tabulators used on the elections. And we have seven of those. We use four at the polls, of course. We have three that we've acquired. One was our own spare, and I acquired two additional spares at um, quite a, a steal because these units are being replaced um, by newer equipment. So I was able to actually purchase one for $50 and one for $1 at some point. Um, but they served us very well during um, the presidential election when we actually did advanced processing of ballots. And I had borrowed another one from our vendor who loaned it to us free of charge. So we actually had four tabulators working on election day, but before that, we had tabulators working at the town hall by uh, sets of election workers who were processing advanced voting uh, ballots. And so we were able to have separate machines set up for both of those going simultaneously. Um, obviously, police details and um, constable, DPW, those costs go down. Um, Printing costs went down a little bit. That's really not election related so much as it is that I ordered less T 
fewer street lists because we knew we would not be selling as many. Um, and supply diminishes because of obviously needing fewer uh, expenses for the fewer number of elections. If anyone has any questions or comments, okay. Mr. O'Leary, <laughs> Mr. O'Leary. Uh, first of all, you know, oh my goodness, you know, talk about timing and stress. I mean, the whole thing hit at all the wrong time for well, every department, every office, but in particular Barbara's relation to the, the, the presidential primary, the town election, the state primary, <laughs> the presidential election, all those things coming at the same, you know, it, it just early voting, mail-in voting, all the nuances and all the things that we, we never encountered before, you know, maybe contemplated, but never encountered, um, you handled the, handled them masterfully. And, and again, it, personally, you know, I was um, questioning a lot of things early on, you know, how are we doing this, how are we doing this, through the town administrator, I'm sure it got to Barbara, um, but you handled them very well, you know, and, and things have, have smoothed out and did smooth out and, People were able to vote easily, and kudos to everybody, you know, including you know your staff, but you know the volunteers and, and the election workers, and I would just say seventy of them. Um, and again, who most of them, as you pointed out, were in a vulnerable stage from an age standpoint, and still stepped forward to ensure that you know the election went forward here, and uh, you did a masterful job. You pulled it off. In addition to our outdoor town meetings, our indoor town meetings. <laughs> oh my goodness! You know the the, the challenges in the in the short period of time that that were faced, you know, by by you and your your department were unimaginable at, at best, and uh, you did a, a fabulous job. You know, in addition to that, handle all the normal workload. Mm -hmm. You know, kudos to you. Uh, and you've also implemented a lot of uh, new processes in relation to technology where information is more available technologically before, because again, this whole process has forced us to move forward more quickly and, and, and good for you. Um, my, my only question and well, suggestion or asks is, um, you know, locally, are there things that we can implement now that we've experienced or any changes based upon those experiences that we should be trying, whether it be the mail-in balloting or whether it be early voting, you know, and what are those costs associated with those? Because to me, I think that's what we're looking forward, looking forward, that's what we're going to be looking at anyway. I, I think the legislature here at the state level is going to be allowing those types of things. Um, you know, should we be moving forward to implement you know, the mail-in voting, the early voting, uh, the, you don't have to give a reason to do absentee voting, um, and now the costs associated with those. And should we be looking at that now rather than a year or two from now? To me, you know, I think it worked very well here in Massachusetts. Across the country, I'm not gonna opine on, but, um, you know, here and locally, you handled it masterfully. Uh, we have a pretty good idea as to what the uh, additional cost would be if we were to implement some of these changes. And if we're allowed to do it locally, I think we should. We should make it as easy and accessible as possible for people to vote. What's the cost associated with that? And what should we be doing to, to move forward? Because I don't see it here. I know you haven't been requested to do that based upon the, the budgetary constraints. But to me, that's what we should be looking at. And, anticipating you know there are there's legislation out there now some of it has been filed by the secretary of state and some you know by by legislators to move forward with um making some of these laws a lot of these laws that um were thrown at us temporarily last year permanent laws and that does include um mail mail ballots you know mail-in voting i'm quite in favor of it statewide. I want to make that clear. I'm not so uh, apt to support it just on the local level, like one community doing it. I think that it needs to be accepted
adopted on the state level because I think it will only create confusion for residents who may move. And there are a lot of residents that move from town to town in Massachusetts every given year. Every year we do the census and um, we see these changes. For residents to move from one community to another and they're used to having something in one community and it's not available in another, that to me is just not a good way to go when you're talking elections. I think it needs to be done on the state level. I think it is going to be done on the state level. I fully anticipate that there's been such a tremendous support for this, that it's been shown, as you said, Mr. O'Leary, to be successful in Massachusetts. I'm not going to speak myself about other parts of the yeah. country for sure. But Massachusetts has always had, I, I believe, very good election laws. I do think that there is an opportunity for, for unfettered voting access. We have always been accommodating to people, even without early voting, to do absentee voting. If there was a need for it, it was there for people. Um, so I do feel that voting is accessible in Massachusetts, um, but this would make it better. And it would be better if it was across the board statewide. There would be far less confusion for, for the voters. Um, and I do see it happening. Um, the legislation is there. There's going to be full support for it. I, I can see that happening. And um, there would be, it would be including um, many of the things that we did this past year. Um, and I know that there are some other things that have been brought forward that were not included this past year to make voting more accessible. So it is in the works. It is good timing because it started now. The bills have been filed and this is going forward looking ahead to 2022. It gives the um, legislators and uh, hopefully all of our voices time to, to chime in and get this to work uh, well for all of the communities, to make it work for large communities, small communities, cities. There are different needs depending on the uh, demographics of every community, and those issues have to be addressed because sometimes the one-size-fits-all doesn't work, but the general overall concepts you know, need to be applied. So um, I do see that coming. Yeah, I see coming. I mean, my only uh, question is, and, and I agree, you know, I think the, the, the legislature is probably going to enact something which is going to allow for, you know, the mail-in voting um, statewide for the statewide elections, whether it be the, the primaries or the general elections and the presidential elections and the uh, presidential primaries. You know, my concern is when they pass it, it's going to be optional because if they pass this legislation and they make it mandatory, you know, they own the cost, meaning the mm -hmm. state. You're right. They make it optional to local communities, you know, in relation to, I, I would anticipate the local elections. You know, to me, why not? You know, yes, there's a cost associated with it, but, you know, if they're going to allow it for presidential primaries, state primaries, general elections, you know, why wouldn't we incorporate it and get people used to uh, incorporating it at the local level. And I know there's an additional cost to it, but again, to me, uh, the ability for people to exercise their right to vote is paramount and the cost is minimal. And we as a board and as a community should be embracing that at this point. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree that one size doesn't fit all, you know? And, and again, and I'm not also looking for the state to pick up the entire cost of all of this because it becomes a state state mandate, even though Proposition Two and a half calls for it. You know, this times are changing. We need to evolve, and I just think we need to be ready to do so. And you know, maybe just um, be prepared to. You know, again, we have a good, we have a, an excellent uh, benchmark uh, with this last year as to what the additional costs are going to be, and we I think we should factor into our budget. But thank you, and again. You, your staff, your volunteers, uh, everybody within Town Hall who's also uh, assisted you and uh, all the people who the election workers have done a fabulous job. The elections went off without a hitch. The town meetings went off without a hitch. 
and you continue to do the uh, required and mandated responsibilities that you have. Congratulations, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner? Yeah, I'll just, just briefly, I mean, there, there was a lot said and you know, it's great stuff. You're on the front line of really the essence of our democratic process. And so I just wanna express my sincere appreciation, I think for many people in town that uh, you implemented all these challenges flawlessly um, and uh, it's it's really just core to our confidence in our government and how we handle things. So thank you so much for uh, continuing to provide that even in a difficult year. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez? I'll try to make this short. Um, you've made it as easy to vote for your budget as you did to vote in the election. <laughs> um, you're always a professional. And um, you really stepped up to the plate when we needed you to, um, you and your staff. So um, no <laughs> questions about the budget. That's a that's an easy one. It's a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, just a sincere thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Studo? Um, I'm gonna be the, C, uh, the select board hero and spare my uh, commentary. Um, I'd just <laughs> like to say uh, thank you, uh, Clerk stats for all your work. Okay. Well, I'm not so sure I'm going to be the hero because I have a question on your budget. So okay. I, I want to make sure that in, in your request, which we appreciate your, you know, the reduction clearly, but is that something that you're going to come back next year and need that worked back into the budget that that amount? It looks like you've reduced it by about $39,000 because of these costs that you detailed to us, but is that peculiar to this past year that we just had? And then next year, we're gonna need to put that back in. Do yes, the budget definitely fluctuates from year to year just based on the number of elections. Um, if you looked in the past, you'll see that that happens regularly as well. So you, you would be looking at an increase for FY23, definitely. Okay. So it's, so um, I guess I never studied it so closely. So, and this is probably the, I don't know, fifth budget maybe for me. So you've done this previously where in uh, the le less number election years, it's a lesser amount that you, so you're increasing and decreasing each. Yes. You know, alternating yes. years, okay. Yes. All right, I just was concerned that, and of course appreciate the reduction, but concerned that it might be something that, you know, you don't you don't want to forego those funds, but that that the town is accepting your, you know, in a year that you have more elections to take care of and more election responsibilities to take care of, the town accepts that, you know, you're putting that in for, you know, this way. Yeah. It, 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 it's um, never been denied, you know, you have to run the elections and, um, you know, we just try to look at the numbers and make sure we can save on the years that we can and the years that we can't, we, these are, you know, required services. And um, even though the budget itself may not be level funded, the services are, they, they, they are applied more time because of the number of elections, but they're not in, you know, uh, additional services. They are services that are required statutorily to be used. Okay. And I just want to say thank you too, very briefly, it, just the tremendous amount of effort that went into it. And people didn't just show up that day and it was set up that day. It was hours and hours of, and a, 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 you know, a multitude of, of staff and volunteers going into it. And I want to say thank you too. We'll uh, turn it over to finance. Uh, Mrs. Hurlbut. It's pretty hard coming after all of you guys that have really said everything that the finance committee probably would have also said. But there's a reason why I refer to uh, Barbara as the town clerk to the stars. <laughs> That's a good title. Well, I keep your meeting notices going too, Abby. <laughs> But I do my no small task. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> but now you have one Zoom invitation for the entire and session. it's posted. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Gamer. 
I have no questions. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you all for your support. Every every year I come to, to these budget meetings and and I get nothing but support for from all of you for my budget. It's all well well deserved. Mr. Johnson. Um, my only thing, any side benefit for uh, with the COVID-19 restrictions on foot traffic or other things that you do in the office other than elections that uh, you have more time for? Believe it or not, we're as busy as ever. We, you know, we had migrated to using a, um, online ordering for vital records and, and that's where almost all of our requests for birth, birth certificates, marriage certificates, death certificates come through. And they come through, you know, every day we get many, many requests. Um, the uh, dog licensing this year has been done through the mail or the ballot drop box. We're utilizing our outside ballot drop box for census and dog licenses um, and any other uh, things that the, pe the public wants to drop off to us to handle. Anything that can be done by mail, we are trying to do it to keep everyone safe. But we do meet with people regularly in the foyer um, to conduct business that requires swearing in all of you board and committee members to, um, you know, uh, getting signatures on marriage licenses, as I said, um, and uh, processing business certificates. So we haven't really missed a beat, but we are trying to do everything uh, remotely that can be done remotely just to limit exposures, you know, for, for all of us, you know, and I, I will say that whatever we're doing is working because our office has not gotten sick. No member of our office has been sick and um, we continue to be able to, to address the needs of the public, you know, very well. Yeah, it was glad to hear that. I was thinking oh, real quick, I thought of something like dog licenses and you say you are doing those. Do we have the same volume of uh, license uh, being processed as we normally do? Uh, do we have, uh, could you repeat that, Dick? Yeah. So something like dog licenses. Yeah. Do we see the same volume of dogs registered as we I, normally do? Yes. I would say we, we are on track with that. But I, while I have the floor here, I will say that we are, we are, um, processing them regularly. We have a backlog of those to do. The census forms are pretty much updated, but those go a little more quickly in processing, but dog licensing takes more time. And sometimes we have to call people to get more paperwork because their rabies has expired um, or they haven't sent us a, a, an altered certificate or the check is wrong or the check is missing. So there is a back, definitely a backlog for dog licensing. And so if anyone out there is listening, you know, we do have, uh, have received them. They are being processed basically in the order of receipt and they will continue to be processed even if the deadline um, of March 31st passes where we normally start um, charging a late fee on April 1, any license paperwork that we've received before that they would never be charged a late fee. And even last year, we just eliminated the late fees in total just to keep processing dog licenses while we were working through the um, unknown circumstances of the pandemic. So I can't, I wouldn't say we have a drop at all in the dog licensing. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Bailey? And no questions. Thank you, Barbara. Let me recap, real. Mr. Kelleher. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Great job. Tough year and a really great job. And I want to thank both you and Carol for helping me post meetings. Thank you. <laughs> we want to keep everyone on the straight and narrow there, Don. <laughs> and Mr. Mills. Uh, no questions. Just uh, appreciate all the work you've uh, done this year. It was a trying year. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Clerk. Staff. Just one more thing, Madam Chair. No, actually, two things. One, Barbara, you have to ensure that we have good meeting for our good weather for our town meeting, like you have in the past. <laughs> Great job for that. And secondarily, just to uh, get an honorable mention for uh, Gloria Mastro, who passed this year as a 
for the registrar. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, you know, so Gloria was just finishing her first three-year term on the board, and um, we were really enjoying her there. And I know she would have stayed on. I know she would have stayed on. And yeah. she was just a joy to have. You know, so we, we sadly we will have to replace her, and 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 we we will miss her. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you, Clark Stats. Okay, and our next and final, thank you for your patience. Mrs. Magner is here to join us for veterans. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> Hanging in there. Um, I have a presentation as well, but um, before I present it, and we don't have to go through the whole presentation, um, I'd just like to make a few comments myself regarding um, COVID-2020. Uh, during the unprecedented 2020 COVID times, the uh, Veterans Department um, began contacting veterans um, and widows who live alone, as well as the families, um, and worked um, with the, throughout the, uh, the generosity of, of local venues um, to include the Horseshoe Grill, Discoli's Pizza, and Nance Cafe. Um, providing meals um, on a regular basis to veterans in need in town. So those, especially the ones that I knew of that were either on chapter 115, finding it tough, or those that are, you know, others that, um, that I knew were just having tough but didn't qualify for the chapter 115. We were assisting getting meals to them on a regular basis. Um, so that, and, and it was so grateful, uh, gracious. We had um, someone um, actually contact my office and he wanted to put X amount a week toward meals um, and made sure that I was spending at least that amount um, to provide meals. So um, it was a donation, um, a, um, a donation, anonymous donation. Um, so um, that was that was a huge a huge um, effort um, and a lot of help um, through um, the staffing of all those places. Um, I'd get the meal count to them or the actual specific dinner orders, um, and um, they would get them delivered, or the individual could go there and pick them up. So either way, it was um, a, a a great um, thing to have going on. Um, through the times, because everybody, as we all know, everybody was having a difficult time through this. In addition, um, phone calls were uh, made um, on, a, on a regular basis um, to ensure there, you know, there was food in the homes, medications, AC, and heat as appropriately needed. Um, and some were just for a friendly phone call, just to say how you doing and checking up on them. Um, as we know, they were all stuck in their homes and alone. Um, I also um, kept my phone lines and the emails open 24-7. Uh, um, somebody called me at 5, 6 o'clock at night. I answered the phone. Um, and that included Saturdays and Sundays. Um, so the lines of communication were constantly there and open for anybody in need. The, um, the other thing I wanted to note was um, through local volunteers to include um, uh, Jerry from, from uh, Ryer's store, um, Connor McIntosh. Cards were made up um, for uh, veterans for Veterans Day as well as Christmas. And we, I had, deli I, I had delivered um, over um, 300 cards um, for um, Christmas and then for Veterans Day, there was over 500 cards we had, <clears throat> excuse me, over 500 cards. Um, that were mailed out to different, um, uh, to the Bedford, uh, the Bedford uh, VA Volunteer Center to get them out there, um, as well as to local nursing homes for veterans in local nursing homes. In addition, um, also um, cards were mailed out through me to the, to those on chapter 115 for Thanksgiving and Christmas too. Um, the, um, we had a multiple, I had a multitude of, of federal claims to file um, to include service connected disabilities um, and also the DIC claims, which is the disability indemnity claim, um, um, 
claim, uh, disability for dis for those who died of disabilities um, that were uh, were um, deemed to be at one hundred percent. So those claims had to go through as well, um, as well as the annuities for the state annuities, and um, and then all the re certifications for chapter 115 have been completed. And um, that was done as well through, uh, all through virtually through email, uh, email um, faxing and um, all the hardcore documents. What I did is I actually made it easier for them by sending them the note, which I do every year, send the notifications, but I send them an extra envelope with a self-addressed stamped envelope, uh, self-addressed stamped on it for, them to submit back to my office with all the documentation. So it was a flagger. It was one of those small yellow envelopes. So they were able to, I was able to flag it easy enough through the mail. Um, I want to, first of all, put a huge thank you out to Maureen Stevens for assisting me because I've been working remotely from home uh, with the, uh, in the office on one day a week. So she checks my mail on a regular basis. So, and puts it in my office and, and Let's me know if there's anything critical that that's in there. So, um, and then I and just leaves it there. So I address it all on Thursday and clear that all out. Um, in addition, um, the uh, the office has been in commun constant communication with the Department of Veterans Services as well as the Mass Veterans, um, the New Northeast Mass Veterans Service officers, and we've been networking on a weekly basis providing um, assistance to uh, and, and, and uh, uh, giving information out regarding other areas uh, for food. Uh, one of the other things that was presented was the Instacart um, uh, that I had presented to them for, and I actually tested it out myself to see how it worked. So um, they were, the Instacart actually did work well and you could actually see everything that you were ordering and, and what they were picking up in the stores. I don't know if anybody had the opportunity to try it, but um, I did give it one shot to see how it worked so I could present it back to the people. Um, for the ceremonies, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, they were both held um, um, virtually. Um, and one of the things I did take the time to do is go through and grab, as uh, put out for pictures, request for pictures through the, the newspaper, through emails and as well as went through myself through all the um, local uh, obituaries um, and went if, uh, for any that we lost and I have and through the years and what I did is I put them all up um, on the on the site so it was added on to the streaming for through NORCAM. Uh, we were unable, unfortunately, due to the due to the obvious, um, to hold the annual dinner this year, uh, last year, and we're hoping maybe possibly this year might be a, a possibility. But again, we're everything's in the waiting in the wings there. I think probably the toughest part with the pandemic for me um, was probably um, the amount of funerals, and so I would definitely feel the. Uh, the the anguish that the uh, funeral directors had because um, we've lost 43 veterans, five of them that I knew of were COVID cases, um, and I had one suicide. So uh, being and that was just on the veteran for for on the federal side and on the state side we also lost seven people um, from Chapter 115. So um, there's been a lot of a lot of deaths around in the office which uh, doesn't, doesn't a number on you. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of assistance um, with, the, with the funeral directors um, for documents requiring um, the discharges to present uh, funeral honors, as well as um, working, working back and forth with the families to assist them with any, any of the things that they needed, as well as um, after filing for any, um, burial expense expenditures. So um, to uh, date, we've done filed 81 federal claims that were um, for social care, I mean, excuse me, service connected disabilities, aid and attendance cases, 
and as well as DIC cases and for burial benefits. Uh, we did a lot of, um, more, um, what was I putting there? I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind. My, uh, the one thing I noticed through this pandemic was the need for the, uh, how crucial the outreach is, is, um, is evident. The need for groups to assist the veterans that are having issues with the PTSD or the MST um, and just to be able to deal with what they've had to deal with um, on the battlefield or just in the military alone, <clears throat> as well as the those that have lost loved ones um, for grief support is is extremely crucial, um, and and that's where the feel for the the need of that administrative assistant that I've put back on again. Um, would come in um, because this is an actual boots on ground um, job and it is the, our duties to get out there to, to let them know the services we can provide for them, whether they're local, state or federal. Um, doing it just through an email or doing it on an, in a paper is just not, is just not cutting it anymore. It just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't get the word out there. Meeting them in person, having um, assemblies of, of sorts um, or small groupings, um, those are where they get to know about those benefits and be able to have the time to ask the questions and get the answers that they require. In addition, um, because of the tax, because of the COVID this year, um, I, the, the, the 47 tax filers that I have for the tax exemption that come through the office, the veterans. Um, I did make, do a mailing out to them so that they had um, with all the instructions required um, for them to fill out the forms and bring them in. So it made it much easier to present those over to the assessor's office for filing. Um, and um, there was a lot of assistance with the veterans to apply for a VA healthcare um, to, uh, for, for their eligibility to get shots. Um, right now, the VA system is still not um, accepting, though the, if you do not have a service-connected disability, um, then they look at the financial end of it and depending where your finances are, whether you qualify for the eligibility for um, healthcare through them. Um, and so um, they need to present all their financials in order to see if they do qualify. And then from there, they get the call. Um, the Zoom meetings um, were great, uh, in my opinion, are great to work with. Um, so that was one great way for all of us collaboratively to work together as, as a team for the VSOs. Um, and other than that, I still punch along and doing the job. Actually, I bought myself a big hardcore printer for home so that I could uh, have no problem with printing anything or getting anything out. So, um, nope, or not on not on the town's dime on my dime. Okay, just so you know. <laughs> well, okay. So just to, to clarify for I, your, I upgraded for your it budget, for just to clarify for your budget presentation that. Um, the, the really the one thing that you're seeking that's an increase is the restoration of that clerical person to assist you because it it was budgeted for FY 2020, but then it was taken out of the budget. So you're just asking for a restoration of that Correct. Part time clerical assistant and that's at twenty one thousand four hundred and twenty one dollars. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you put that back into your budget request for this period great and, I, and and everything else is level funded all right so let's go and see if we have any questions or comments for right, mr o'leary uh so you know just you know like elder services youth services you know veteran services you know your outreach and counseling has been critical um effective and, and comforting for so many people and again i've heard it from members of the community um that the outreach that you've you know engaged in has made a difference 
They appreciate it. It was initiated by you, not by them. And, and it's greatly appreciated. And again, the assistance and facilitating of applications on behalf of the veterans, um, not threatening veterans in relation to the benefits that they would be eligible for, you know, is fantastic. So, um, you know, because of that outreach, we've never had so many people uh, who are eligible become eligible uh, for those services. And it's only as a direct result of your outreach. And, you know, since you've been here, the numbers have been know, quadrupled or more, you know, uh, much to your credit. And, uh, you know, for that, you know, everybody's, uh, everybody's grateful, you know, and as far as, you know, what your needs are, you know, we're hearing it, uh, certainly we'll uh, consider it. And if we can do it, we'll do it because it's, Again, it's another segment of the community that deserves our respect, deserves our, deserves our support, um, support. And um, the veterans here are lucky to have you. So um, much appreciated for all the effort that you've done. And again, the challenges that you face over this last year, again, are, are so different uh, just because of the pandemic, but you've done a fantastic job. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Studo. I'd just like to say thank you. Um, you know, it's, um, I think I've stated in the past that that's, I feel veterans in general in this country are underappreciated, um, unfortunately, you know, just because uh, the times of, uh, for all the complaining we do in this country, the times have been pretty good in the U.S. for a while now. So I feel that, uh, you know, there's a whole generation of people that understand that there's a reason they get to walk around with a thousand dollar iPhone. So I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Mr. Walner. Yeah. Um, I've been outside your office a number of times, your clientele, which I think is about 600 people. I believe that's the number I used to know at least. Um, when they come to your office, they're really coming to see you and they are really, really depending on you. I mean, you can just tell that you know, it's, it's, it's more than just, you know, you're not just providing customer service, you're providing a link that they probably don't have in any other way. And it's just very impressive to see. So um, yeah, in this case, if you need something extra to provide, you know, consistent, reliable service to a huge book of clientele, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. So thank you, Sue, for what you do. Thanks, Rich. Mrs. Gonzalez. No, we save the best for last. So. <laughs> I mean, this isn't just a job for you. It's a, it's a passion. Um, it's emotionally involved with you. So um, you're valuable and we're lucky to have you. And so, so are our veterans. Um, you'll always be a rock star for that wall that heals. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in Natick, by the way, they've already called me. Really? I mean, no, Nahant, Nahant, yeah. Just such such a fabulous, great thing you did to bring that here. So, um, you know, that uh, you absolutely need this help. I know you need this help. Um, so if we can do this for you, we will do this for you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Greatly appreciated. This is Herbert. Um, so you always do a great job, and I know that this year has been particularly sad and difficult, as well as tricky trying to work out how you can do it around COVID, and congratulations on going the extra mile and doing a great job. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just echo what everyone else is saying. It's uh, for all of those running a department with one person, I... I I just don't know how you do it. So just amazing work you guys do and uh, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. I appreciate everything Sue's done and this year, especially, I imagine it was much more taxing with more need and more sorrow <laughs> to deal with. So good work, Sue. Thank you. Mr. Bailey. Uh, no questions. Thanks for the hard work this year in a, in a very tough environment. Thank you. Mr. Kelleher. Uh, thanks, Sue. You you really do a, a great job. It's a, it's a tough job, but it's ab absolutely needed. And the people you're providing services to deserve everything you can give them and everything you have. 
have it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Mills. Yeah, I'll just echo what everyone else has to say. Just really appreciate all the uh, hard work and uh, passion that you put into your, your job. Um, I don't have any specific uh, comments, questions, thanks. Yeah, I think with I think with the money clerk stats saved us. I think we should be funding this. I think we should just put it right back into your. We had it there before. You need the help. You do tremendous work, and you do tremendous work for a tremendous population of our residents, the veterans. So we're lucky to have them, and we're lucky to have you too. So thank you for everything you do. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. I'd like to just put a shout out to 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 Mary and and Jen Mary Pretty and Jen Ford too because we kind of we chimed a lot together this year, you know, and a lot of brainstorming going on and and back and forth trying to assist each other as much as we could, you know. So, you know, it that was that was that was huge keeping each other's chins up and stuff. So definitely, definitely great. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. All right. So I think that concludes all of the departments that we're going to be seeing this evening. And um, in this, if there's no other comment from either, from anyone, we're going to move on to public comment for us. <laughs> all right. Okay. Is there anyone here that would like to speak in public comment? They deserve the opportunity sitting through all of this for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is our one chance to kind of really directly interface with these departments. And so I'm sure pe that people are listening and saying, why do they, why are they think? Because we don't get to have this opportunity. So budget presentation is that one time that we're able to directly interact on everything that's been done during the year and, and you know, the needs. So it's important to, acknowledge people's good work for the town for sure so i don't see anyone do you mr gilberto there's no chat people all right that's so we can i guess move on to the town administrator's report mr gilberto thank you madam chair a few things that i would like to update the board on um, this evening <clears throat> The first is that as of February 20th, the fee for paying bills online using a credit card is no longer being waived. Uh, we had been waiving that during the course of the early part of the pandemic and through a good chunk of time. Um, the Treasurer Collector's Office has issued demand notices for our overdue bills um, for the first time in a number of months, and they are working through the issues with individual residents on a case by case basis as the calls come in. Additionally, um, as some of you may know, a large commitment of motor vehicle excise tax bills is being issued um, uh, at this time. Our water and trash bills are also recently issued and reflect the increase in the water rate approved in um, November or December by the board uh, as of January 1st. So there is quite a bit of activity happening on, from a revenue standpoint here in the town hall. And I do wanna acknowledge the work of the treasurer collector's office, which continues to offer to, to operate um, down one administrative staff person uh, in the front of the, um, the office, uh, a position that you'll hear about in the next budget hearing that we are hoping to restore. Um, I included in my report uh, information from the police department relative to an advisory to residents warning them about scams uh, involving tax returns. Um, with it being the time of year, there is quite a bit of activity that's going on around there. And I think all of us have probably seen or heard about it in the media, but our police department is trying to stay ahead of things and let, um, you know, ask folks to be, uh, to be vigilant, um, check on friends and family, particularly those who uh, might, be, um, might be vulnerable to um, this type of activity. Um, as our boards and commissions and committees continue the work of the town virtually, I did circulate some recommendations uh, in an email that I attached in the report, and I, I saw a number of folks over the a, a few meetings over the past few days uh, taking those into consideration. Certainly, greatly appreciate that. Um, you know, really just wanted to put that information out there as more and more activity that was sort of on on hold has been picked up in recent weeks, and uh, will continue to be picked up in recent in in the, in the coming weeks as we go into the town meeting and go through this budget process. Um, and you know, really at this moment 
I think we're all optimistic, but we don't have a timeline for when those when that work will be able to take place um, in person. So, um, you know, as things move forward, I offered some some feedback um, to our to our boards and committees, and to our employees, which I uh, appreciate they're considering. Um, our director of information technology, Matt Cooper. His last day was Friday, February 26th. Brian Carter, who has been in the office for, I believe, seven years now, uh, will be serving as acting director while we search for a permanent director in the office. And um, some of you know Brian previously filled in um, after the uh, sudden death of uh, Gene Tork um, four years ago now. Um, so we know we will be in uh, good hands and appreciate Brian's willingness to help. Um, Fire Chief Don Stats announced the receipt of two grants, $4,692 for the Student Awareness for Fire Education or SAFE program, um, which is primarily run in the schools, as well as $2,480 for the Senior SAFE program, um, focusing on senior citizens. So we certainly appreciate the state's partnership in obtaining that grant funding. And finally, I know that she is here uh, Jane, um, as I think the board members know, she's advised me of her intention to resign from her position effective April 22nd to spend more time visiting with family. Um, this uh, is uh, going to be her last meeting serving as the recording secretary for the board this evening. So um, I know the board members all joined me in wishing her well and thanking her for her, uh, her service in the role as uh, recording secretary. There she is. Hi, Jane. <laughs> We um, don't have to accept that resignation, do we? <laughs> we yeah, actually, we're turning it down and saying no. <laughs> Not accepted. But um, okay. did you see what's behind me? <laughs> oh, thank you. They're yes. beautiful. Good, good. They look great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, we do, we do want to take a few minutes and just say thank you to you. Mr. O'Leary, you can kick it off for us. I can kick it off. When Jane first applied for the job, I went, Jane's applying for this job. It's like, it didn't fit for me, from what I knew Jane. Again, I knew Jane because our kids grew up together. You know, and it's like, Jane's applying for this job. And I'm going, really? <laughs> but, you know, and I'm, I'm saying, oh my goodness, boy, did she fit in. And she fit in perfectly well because, you know, first of all, she wasn't political. She, she had no inclination or desire to know who was who, what was what, or anything else and just do what needed to be done. And she has done it masterfully. And it has been able to, uh, to to keep that distance as far as opinions and everything else. And you, you look at the minutes, um, how they've been done, how they've been done. And, and, and Jane, I sympathize with you. But I also know, you know, from all my past history, uh, while you have suffered with us, you know, you have suffered less because you have done a fantastic job in relation to capturing what what we all have to say and what we're trying to say, you know, in relation to the license renewal and efficiency of, of that whole operation, you have been instrumental in making sure that that's been streamlined for all of the applicants and businesses in the community. Uh, the response from the community in relation to their interaction with you has been nothing but favorable and fantastic. And, you know, they just feel at ease and it's like no big deal. You know, you're missing this, you're missing that. All you have to do is bring this in and you're all set. And people understand that uh, you, you've simplified it for them and you've made it very, very efficient and they appreciate it. And for me personally, you know, when I've called upon you to, to give me some information and things like that, you've just been uh, fantastic and you've been uh, above that, a good friend. And uh, good for you. Good for you for making this choice. Bad for us. I'm very disappointed that you're leaving, you know? Matter of fact, I'm a little pissed off. But anyway, good for you. Enjoy it. Enjoy your family. Uh, go to Chicago. Go to Colorado. See your grandson. Um, enjoy it. You Thank know, you so much. I really appreciate everything you've done. It, it means a lot what you just said. So much. Thank you very, very much. Wow. You're welcome. You're welcome. You came from the heart. I didn't make it up. I didn't, you know, I mean it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Studo. Um, so Jane is the first person I actually met after I got elected uh, because, you know, during COVID, you would think that like the first time I went to town hall, I, I felt like I was Will Smith in the movie Legend. I was just like me outside. 
And like, you know, Jane was kind enough to come out, you know, and risk her life in COVID to give me <laughs> some feedback. So I really do appreciate it because it was uh, it's overwhelming at first, especially when you're in a situation where typically you'd get a crash course in person with all the different board members. And I couldn't get that because of circumstances. So I really do appreciate it. I remember uh, Jane reminded me that I was going to have a baby more than my wife, because I think she emailed me every two weeks saying the baby come yet, baby come yet. So I really do appreciate that someone I just met took that kind of involvement in my family. So that's, you know, that, that, that sticks out. I mean, it just, it's the thought that counts, I think 90% of the time. So Jane, uh, you know, I know we talked a little bit like when I would see you out there, but I hope you have a great time with your family. It definitely, uh, I think we took visitations for granted for a while in this day and age. So I think it's a perspective uh, everyone's taking. So uh, enjoy whatever it is that you're going to do, you know, which should be everything. So, and thank you again. Thank you so much. Mrs. Gonzalez. Uh, so I also knew Jane outside of this, you know, before. Um, I can't say enough about just like Mr. Studo said, you know, when I first came on and, you know, you're trying to figure it all out and it was always a smiling face, you know, Jane always had a smiling face. I never, she never made me feel like I was bothering her no matter how many times I popped in there pre COVID <laughs> when you could pop in there and um, just always willing to help and, and always, smiling and and you, you just never felt like you were putting her out and bothering her so I appreciate that and um don't know how you kept everything straight with us all talking over each other sometimes <laughs> it's a little challenging sometimes but yeah, yeah. I'm sure <laughs> but I wish you all the best you deserve it and you know go enjoy those grandchildren and thank you Leanne thank you Mr. Waller yeah, I haven't really known Jane all that much, but um, our, our exchange, like everybody else, has been very pleasant. I've always enjoyed it. Um, and how you two, we two are verbose, <laughs> this is beyond me. <laughs> I could never, actually, I read the meeting notes to try to remember or try to decipher what we all said, because sometimes it's very confusing. So thanks for sorting that out for us. Um, but you're not, you, one time you were not smiling. And the one time you were not smiling was during a meeting when the shelves came crashing down in your office. That was one time when you were not smiling. And, but we, we sure had a lot of interest running your office to see what came crashing down, which was half your office. So um, thanks for, thanks for uh, providing levity to um, our, our, our situations. Thank you, Jane, we'll, we'll miss you a lot. Hope you come back if you possibly can. Thank you, Rich. And I'll just say from the chair too that, you know, you do things so calmly and quietly and kindly. And I know, I know there have been times when you, when you, I probably irked you and annoyed you, especially with the minutes, <laughs> but you would never know that with you. And I agree with Leanne. I met you through this service on this board and there's not a time that I wouldn't stop in that, um, you didn't have a smile on your face. You never felt like you were bothering you or disrupting you. And you could have a nice sit down, have a nice conversation with you. But I think you're probably one of the warmest and most empathetic people that I know, aside from the great professional work that you do and the professional way that you do it. You're just a beautiful person inside and out. And I really appreciate all the help that you've given me and everyone else and all the work that you've done for us and it's a big loss for us but we also know you know it's time for you to move on in the journey and have some have some fun away from this board <laughs> so enjoy thank you for everything that you've done you're a wonderful person and we really appreciate everything you've done for us and the town well, I can't thank you guys enough for it. I'm so humbled by everything that you said. Um, like I'm shaking, I'm so humbled. <laughs> you know? um, but also, I, I'll, I, I'm just gonna keep this real quick. Uh, the, the time and devotion that you guys give to North Reading is amazing. You know, and um, it's been great working with you all. And um, 
North Reading is lucky to have such devoted people looking out for their best interest. Really, it's, it's, I've learned so much and uh, it's been interesting. We hope you keep in touch. Oh, I definitely keep will. Keep us updated on your travels and your, your adventures. I will, I definitely will. I'll miss you. And it's you nice so to much. see, and it's nice to see your face, Jane, because I, I, know, know. I know during these Zoom meetings, you yes. don't see your face yeah. because most of the time you're like this, <laughs> pulling your hair out. Trying to keep track of what we're saying and what we're doing. But especially with Zoom. <laughs> I always have my pajamas on, my hair up, my face washed. I, I, I was gonna say you look marvelous this year. One o'clock in the morning. Yeah, you look marvelous. <laughs> I know that's I, I the worst. Put some effort into it. <laughs> but look at how beautiful these flowers are. Thank oh, that's good. What You're welcome. Like good. Good. Well, thank you, Jane, for everything. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? No. no. Not Michael, yet. I, I know. We have <laughs> still we have and we wait board member reports for Jane and <laughs> all the new business for Jane this evening. And, and I didn't get any of that in the notes. It was <laughs> hard, right? Anything you said is it's just going to be. Between us. No, no please, you need to please reflect that for posterity's sake so that, that people know what a good servant you were to the town as well. And Mr. Gilberto, we, I should have asked you too. Mr. Gilberto wants to say a few things too. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. He has until April 22nd. I, I do, I do, I do have time. You're right, uh, Jane. I, 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 you know, you're, you're, we're, we're saying farewell from the board this evening, but you know, you will be with us for a few more weeks, but some things I would like to say, you know, in front of the board and with the board here is, Jane has been a, a, a such an important part of um, my being able to try to discharge what you're asking, you know, each Monday night adequately. And we talk things through on the Tuesday mornings and we have a standing meeting that I always end up having to postpone or reschedule, but we, we always go through what's come out of the meetings and Jane has always, you know, since day one been a very important part of making sure that we're doing what you're asking us to do, you know, as, as uh, the follow-up actions or whatever the items are. So she's been, you know, such an important part, you know, for, for me and then for, you know, for Karen as well here in the office. I also just want to add that she's been, you know, Jane, you've been, I feel like I'm talking in a third person here, Jane, <laughs> you've been such a great friend, you know, to, to, to experience the meetings and taking the meetings and, and kind of taking them and, and, and turning the discussion into action. Um, and I, I've really enjoyed that. And some of the board members may or may not know, but you've been such a, a great friend to so many people here in the town hall too. And fortunately for, for them and for me, we you know we do have a few more weeks with you here, but um, I wanna thank you for that as well. Um, so, you know, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And if you change your mind, it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'll keep you. <laughs> Um, so do we have, we should kiss you, <laughs> too bad in honor of Jane, we can't just wave these. They were on the agenda though. Does anyone have anything for, we have to we just keep it short. Board, <laughs> <laughs> board member report <clears throat> next and, and all the new business. Anything, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, in honor of Jane, no. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. <laughs> anything, Mr. Studo? Jane, I'd love to honor you, but I have to bring this up because oh. everybody, I'm sorry. Um, so I was uh, just kind of a follow up on the uh, Pulte is going on on front of the TBA again this Thursday. I did um, I did receive a call from Pulte, and they wanted me to relay, you know, to the board as liaison that um, they are prepared to go to 15 percent on the affordable units for the additions they're making. Um, so I guess, uh, I mean, it's not the 20 that we put in our letter, but it, either. it you know, it, uh, it, it, I, I know that they said 10 at the last uh, ZBA hearing, but they just wanted me to relay uh, to the board that they are prepared to go to 15 and that's what they're going to uh, offer up at the, uh, at their, at their next public hearing at the ZBA. So that just, I just needed to relay that. Sorry, Jane. I just, uh, <laughs> that's on Thursday. 
Oh, Mr. Correct. Schiff. Yes. So are you looking just for a consensus of the Bloomington you know, go, you're going, are you going to the meeting as uh, I'm, meeting? I'm going. So, and again, I, I, I had to share this with the whole board, you know, and I'm just looking for mm. a consensus opinion, something. So, okay. you know, okay. when inevitably I get asked what the select board thought about this, I can give an answer. Right. Because I think we put that letter in as a result of our last discussion of it. The letter went in, right, Mr. Gilberto, for the for the twenty percent as the in the best interests of the of the town. So, in in other words, if if you are called upon to give an opinion on fifteen percent, that's what you're looking for for the for what the boards. Because I have my opinion, but I need everybody's opinion. Consensus on that is okay. Well, we'll just pull the members. What do you think of that, Mr. Walner? Um, I think the 20% was a fair ask. I'm still kind of dedicated to that number. Okay. Mr. O'Leary? Uh, again, I appreciate Pulte's, uh, first of all, listening in their sympathetic ear and understanding what our position is. I appreciate their um, movement. Uh, I still think the 20% is a reasonable ask. Um, and I leave it up to the Zoning Board of Appeals to make an informed decision. Okay. And Mr. Mrs. Gonzalez, what would um, you I, I think, I mean, I, I'm comfortable with the 15. I think that, I think that's a win-win for everybody. Okay. And Mr. Studo, what's your thought? Um, I, um, I agree. I think they moved, um, you know, I, I initially thought the letter was a little strong. I will uh, give credit where credit's due, Mr. O'Leary. Um, you know, I did think your letter, uh, you know, I, I know we agreed and, you know, we were on kind of opposite sides when we were talking about it. And then they went to 10 and then now, un again, unsolicited, that, that's the big thing to me, the unsolicited part. Um, you know, the ZBA, the, the board, I mean, the board made a suggestion, but, you know, it's not like we talked about it with them. They just kind of, so, you know, that's what I saw that, you know, it, it was kind of the 10 came out of the blue and then the 15 came out of the deep blue. Best best way to, you know, describe it. So um, I think they met us more than halfway to the letter. So that's how I'm looking at it. You know, if zero is their way, 20 was our way, 15 is still, you know, I, I look at it as a win. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, in I'm, I'm in favor of, you know, my opinion is I think it's good. Mm -hmm. And just from the chair, I, I would agree with you. I think the 10% keeps it it's at, as no harm, the 5% in addition to that addresses, you know, some of the lack of affordability and what was already there, which, you know, we can't reinvent the past and we can't, you know, recreate that. What we accept it as a board unanimously, we accept it, but I think that their willingness to, um, you know, move that dial to 15 is important for the town. And I also think it's important for us, even if it's not a unanimous consensus, I think if it's a majority consensus, I think it's important for that. Um, if, if you're even questioned at the meeting, I think it's important to convey that, you know, because we have one letter in saying 20 and if there's a, a consensus that thinks 15 is worth worth considering, you know, worth asking the ZBA to consider. I think that's important too. Mr. Mr. O'Leary, Mr. O'Leary, you had in your relation hand. to what we're being asked to consider at the June town meeting in relation to the overlay affordable housing districts and all mm -hmm. those sorts of things. You know, we're, we're looking at a 20% figure. And if we're going to be consistent with that, we're looking about, you know, we're looking at 20% of 50 units as opposed to 20% of 502 units that they have there. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable. And I think if we're gonna be consistent moving forward in sending a message, you know, I think the 20% is, is, is the benchmark we should be using. And again, I, I appreciate their listening. I appreciate their uh, willingness to move uh, but by the same token. This is a big ask of us from them, you know, to make up for the lack of due diligence that they had done on the property. And uh, we're willing to assist them in making up for the shortfall because of the unforeseen uh, contamination on the site. But by the same token, I think they have an obligation to uh, assist us in, in meeting our affordable 
housing needs. And I don't think the 20% of 50 units is unreasonable. So, you know, but again, I, I appreciate the, the willingness to listen, the willingness to move, uh, but by the same token, we have to be consistent in what we're looking to do moving forward. And I think the 20% is, is the issue and in the benchmark that we should be looking at moving forward. And again, that could be, that we could move on that, you know, 10 or 15 years from now when we meet the affordable housing needs, but we're not there yet. So uh, I, would ask my, I would ask my my colleagues to just think about that in relation to what we're looking at as soon as June. You know? I understand, but I don't think if we, we've as a board have even voted on the overlay, if whether no. or not that's acceptable to a majority of the board. I don't, so. I don't disagree, but, the, but by the same token, an over, overlay districts are a good idea. You know, whether that specific one is, is the one that we want to endorse, you know, the overlay district idea being proposed and being considered by the CPC, which appears to be favorable, is something that we should be looking at and considering. And I think the 20% 20, 20 benchmark is reasonable. And if we're going to be reasonable and going to be consistent, that's what the message we need to start sending now. We do for new development. I agree with you on that point, but I'm not, I don't necessarily know that we have, you know, we haven't really we didn't even really pull the membership because we just had that before the overlay before us as a kind of an informational thing. And I think it needs, you know, and he's, we're going to see it, we're going to see it revisit again What, you know, back to us at some point for vote, but Mrs. <laughs> Gonzalez, you've got your hand up. Yeah. You just touched on what I was going to say. I mean, I just kind of feel like this is apples and oranges as far as new development or the overlay, like, you know, this, Pulte was has already done their thing, and and this is an isolated situation. And I don't think it's a benchmark for going forward. I think it's a, a separate thing that's happening going forward. Um, I'm fine with the twenty percent, but I think this is just a separate, isolated thing that that we could do a little give and take on. That's just me. Okay. All right. It, 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 just in response that, you know, what we have here is a situation where they already have 450 some odd units uh, approved. And this is moving forward. This is an expansion of a existing plan uh, that they're looking for to make up for additional costs that were unforeseen on their part. And if they're looking to partner with us, this is future expansion. This is future development. This has got to be, to me, consistent with what we're looking to do moving forward. And it's not a big ask. And again, 15 to 20%, you know, 5% of 50 is not a lot of units, a couple of units. Eight. No, no, no. It, it, it's 2.5 units. No, oh, but the additional five percent is an additional two point five oh, two point five yeah. units. What they're looking to to offer. Well, you know, and, and again, if they want to make up for their losses, and again, if they can't make up for all of it, they can make up for a substantial portion of it. We're willing to assist them, but they need to meet us too. That's all. I'm good. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Studo. Response. I mean, I'm, and and maybe I just look at things differently in general. But I don't look at this as a zero sum game. 15% or eight units is actually 7.8, but round up to eight. 15% uh, of something is better than, you know, 100% of nothing. And it's something where, you know, um, again, I'm, I'm newer to this and looking at it, but from that project and just to even add the eight, I just feel like we do a lot of talking around here about expanding the affordable housing and then an opportunity arises and we're just trying to, you know, win a back and forth match. Like, and maybe I've always looked at this differently, but my understanding is that I agree with you, Mr. O'Leary, should be a hundred percent ZBA independent. But my understanding is too, that there's a good chance too, just like there was a good chance that they would get this approved without offering anything affordable. So now that they are offering 15 and I'm not saying that should that's it's just an opinion of us. We we don't get to make this decision. However, I'm just looking at it that you get eight units here, you get some there, you know, a bunch from Mr. Wheeler's, and all of a sudden you're way past that glam number. But 
this all or nothing approach, I just, I disagree with it. And because I've learned in business that all or nothing, usually you just, you hand up uh, what I'm not even going to say how you end up. So I'll, I'll spare my analogy there. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Mr. O'Leary. You know, you're talking eight units or 10 units. You're talking 50 units or no units for them. The town is not obligated. The Board of Appeals is not obligated to issue them or acquiesce to their request. They offered us zero in their first proposal. They offered us nothing. We were asked to render an opinion or we offered an opinion saying that any future expansion of that development should incorporate some sort of affordable housing aspect to it. And in our due consideration looking forward, it's 20% of any new development going forward. To me, this is an addition to what they have. So, you know, they offered us nothing, then they offered us 10, now they're offering us 15. They have a business decision to make. And I don't disagree with Mr. With Mr. Studo, that this is a business decision on their part, not our part. This means absolutely nothing to us if nothing changes. We have factored nothing into our revenue stream for any additional units there. This is a bonus if they do put in 50 more units because we get more tax revenue out of it, which is more than revenue neutral. It is a positive effect, no doubt, but nothing we have factored into. But because of the situation they're in, they're asking for some consideration and to me, get asking for some concessions to allow them to build more. And to me, moving forward, we have an obligation to meet our housing needs. We're woefully inadequate. We got lucky with the Lincoln properties, uh, the Edgewood, you know, to get the, all those 406 units included as, a, as affordable, but those are on a timeline. You know, those are gonna expire. We need to do more moving forward in any new development, including an expansion of this one, should assist us in meeting that obligation. And 20% is not unreasonable based upon their current situation, their financial situation and what they're asking for. And whether it be Mr. Wheeler or any other new development in town, this is what our position should be so that we can meet the 10% overall and we need to make up for it. And to me, you know, this is not an unfair ask. So I understand the economics of it and right. the business decision. Okay. But we do know, we do have to move on, and I think you at least have a you have a majority of the board. You don't have, you definitely don't have a consensus of the board. It's very clear, but you have a majority of the board if if you're even asked. But it, again, it's not even our it's not even up to us. But I'm you know I suppose because you're there, you may be questioned about it. You know because it I think in the last hearing they didn't make a decision on it. They continued that hearing. So I'm sorry. That's that's when Thursday evening. Correct, at um, seven. Yeah, seven, I think okay. seven. Yes, uh, Mr. O'Leary, seven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anything else, Mr. Studo? Did you have no. anything else? Okay. Sorry, Jane. Mrs. Gonzalez, <laughs> that's all right. Hopefully the rest of us will, <laughs> Mrs. Oh, Gonzalez. Sorry, Jane, sorry, Jane. <laughs> no, no, that's important for it. She, she, Jane's used no, to I us. I started it. <laughs> Mrs. Gonzalez. I have no board member reports. All right. Do, do, do we do we are we lumping old and new business in together? By the way, do you have yeah, I have no new business either. All right, Mr. O'Leary, do you have? Oh, I'm good. Right. <laughs> Mrs. Gonzalez, what's your old and new business? We're just kind of lumping it together. Um, I just want to talk just quickly about um, something that um, we did this week for George Souza scholarship. Um, just because it's a feel good. Um, Jerry and I, I, if any of you knew George Souza, he was the manager at the UPS store and he had a massive heart attack and he passed away. And when that happened, it became clear to the whole town that he touched people. Just, he was just such a kind person who made everybody feel like they were his favorite customer and nobody else knew that they weren't his favorite customer. <laughs> he just made everybody feel that good. So um, Jerry Farrelly and I um, created magnets that said, um, be kind, be like George, be kind. 
and they sold like hotcakes and we donated the money to his family. And now fast forward, um, Dave Benoit from Descolis jumped in and he would raise money um, also. So we had this pot of money and Descolis was going out of business. So he reached out to Jerry and I, what should we do? And we created this um, nominate a person in town that you feel is kind and selfless and giving. And we got 10 nominations and we were supposed to do three winners. We ended up with two. Yeah, and we ended up with four. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, Lena Simone, Penny Richards, Raymond Talk, and Emma Forrestal were our four winners. Um, just for being people that give back to the town, give to other people, make people feel good. And that they're just generous, selfless people. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Walner. Yeah, just an update from our last meeting um, regarding Car Cars Hallmark. Um, we had a tentative plan to, as the board, to help support the grassroots effort, to help uh, support cars and their efforts to stay in their location. Um, the people who are involved, uh, Rita Mullen and Joyce Davis are aware of our show of support. Uh, they have written a letter. Um, they have, uh, I think in a series of negotiations have been extended uh, 60 days on to the lease to help um, them to sell off their inventory. So I encourage the town to go down and do that. There is no plan right now for another location. Um, obviously, we have time on our side, uh, but they just asked us right now. They, they realize we want to support them with a letter. Um, when they want us to get involved, they'll let us know. But for right now, they're kind of taking it on their own and they're doing what they think is the right thing. Right. And so that's where it's at. That's the best we can do at this point. Mm -hmm. So it was nice. They felt supported that we were willing to help them get it done. And they'll call us and we need to do that. So that's where it's at. Thank you. Do you, do you have any um, old old or new business that's all uh, that's i blended okay. it all together good. i'm good i'm good so do we have a motion to adjourn uh, motion to adjourn uh, i'll second that thank you jane yes mo jane. <laughs> motion thank by you. mr studio second by mr o'leary we all thank you jane mr o'leary uh make sure the thank you jane are in the minutes <laughs> so you I that's awkward. I'm not putting that in there. Yeah, no, no, you, you have, have to. to. You, you have, have no choice. <laughs> Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Thank you, Jane. Mrs. Manupelli says aye. <laughs> and thank you, guys. See you later, guys. Peace. Thank you. Have a nice night. Thank you. Good night, everybody.